بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته we, wake, we welcome y'all to another gathering of the Black Imams Roundtable I am Imam Amin Muhammad Below me is Imam, below me in position, definitely not in status, is the great Imam genius, Imam Naeem Abdullah. And next to him, but not at the same status, is the Imam of the Boom Bat, a little bit higher because he got that street cred, you know, there's something that go with it. You know, you got intellectuals and then you got grassroots warriors. So when you put them together, you got something there. Wait, Imam Genius, you more than the, uh, just the intellectual. <laughs> so I'm a grassroots warrior too, right? Uh, alhamdulillah. And we have a special beloved guest, our brother, Imam Sheikh Yusuf Krumer, uh, as the old uh, one I remember him, says Seth Afriki, right? I, keep, I can't get that out of my mind. But this is a dynamic young brother from our community who is an up and coming, learned scholar, entrepreneur, visionary, youth mentor. He got it all wrapped up in the one. May Allah reward him. Jazakallahu khaira, inshallah. So we're going to have, a, this is going to be like the journey of our youth. And I think if I could speak of a young black man in America who embody all what we trying to get across on this Black Imams Roundtable, I can think of no one clearer than this young man right here. And it's it's a pleasure to have him with us, you know. And inshallah, I'm going to pass the microphone to our favorite Imam genius. And I'm going to go pray and I'll be back. Inshallah. Barakallahu bikum. Audhu billahi min shaitani rajeem. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbin alameen. Wa aftalu salatu wa tamu tasneen. Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ana alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa radiyallahu ta'ala ana sati tatabi'een wa ulama al-amaleen wa a'imatu al-arabat al-mujtahideen wa maqalidihim ila yawmi deen. Amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah. You know, I don't know how I should take that introduction, man. Imam Otis took away my street credibility. <laughs> Allah knows, man. Don't even worry about it. Nah, man, I elevated your status, man. <laughs> a general intellectual, right? Section <laughs> 8 scholar, right? <laughs> like I always say, if I'm the genius, we in bad shape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mashallah, alhamdulillah. It's always a pleasure to uh, uh, join, you know, my fellow imams and even our honored guests, all of them that we have every week uh, when we have them and this week is is no exception alhamdulillah and all of you who are in the comments and participating in the conversation along with us you know alhamdulillah i, I appreciate all of your all of your company and i know imam fahim is going to remind you but you know if you see me looking down that means i'm looking at my phone and what i was doing when imam I mean, introduced me was paying my door fee, and I don't want to get distracted, so I'm doing that right now. And I hope you all will join me uh, in that. You know, we ask that all of you pay, uh, put something forward in regards of something tangible, i.e., some cash, every week, so that we can finance and fund you know, our own activities so we won't have our lower hand out. You know, we have the upper hand out. So when we do activities and uh, try to give dawah and do the different things that you all know that we are involved with, that we are supporting and funding ourselves. And that's extremely important. We don't want anyone else holding our purse strings. So alhamdulillah, I don't have too much to say right now. I'm really interested to hearing uh, what our distinguished guest has to say. So I'm going to pass it off to the Imam of the Boom Bap. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa mani tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawm al-deen wa ba'd. Alhamdulillah, thank you all for joining us tonight. We appreciate your presence. You know, you could have been anywhere in the world today, in the virtual world, but you decided to be here with us. We definitely appreciate it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, honor you, and raise your rank. I mean, yeah, so I'm just in the crowd today. I bought a ticket, you know, when I seen uh, Sheikh Youssef was on, on, the, on the venue. I just caught me a ticket. I'm going to sit in the back, you know. I hope you all caught your tickets too. So, uh, yeah, I was reminded that we should use, uh, you know, a different language when we uh, reminding people to uh, generously donate. So maybe when I say drop that bread, it's a little bit too raw. But uh, drop that bread. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, we ask you all by Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala to please try to give a contribution. May Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala double and multiply your reward and put place it on your scale of good deeds, something that will show up on Yom Kiyama. So we ask for a minimum of $10. And um, we have some very um, great people in the audience, you know, people who are two to one, 10 to one favorites. You know, some of y'all make up 10 people, so it ain't nothing for y'all to drop $100 or more, inshallah, with the island. So we definitely appreciate it. May Allah, who's come with Allah, bless you all. So without any further delay, uh, we have our brother, Sheikh Yusuf, and, um, you know, we're just going to lay back in the cut and uh, let him do his thing. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alladhi allamana min al-ulumi ma bihi ka'lafana. Salla wa sallimu ala muhammadi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa al-muqtadi wa ba'd. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be welcomed to this uh, round table. I got a call from the great Imam Suleiman from Atlanta. He said that you finally earned your stripes. You made it to the table, you know, mashallah, <laughs> with the great Imams. Uh, as Imam Amin said, the Imam genius. <laughs> and our, our beloved Imam Fahim. So inshallah, I'll just perhaps start by giving a brief uh, background about who I am and where I came from. Um, as you all know, my name is Yusuf Kroma. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, PA. My family is actually from West Africa. My father is from Guinea Conakry, uh, from the Madingo tribe, and my mother is from Liberia, Monrovia, uh, from the Kran tribe. I grew up in a very interesting household, whereas that on one side, all my Guinea family are all Muslims. As you know, Guinea is like 98% Muslims. And then my mother's side, all Christians. So I grew up in, yeah, and my mother didn't embrace Islam until I was in my early teenage years. So growing up, I actually had, I don't want to say the best of both worlds, but I learned the biblical text. My grandmother would come through and teach us things about the Bible. And they had a very, they were very serious Catholic Christians. And they had very principled people. And some of the principles they taught me, I live by it to this day, how to treat other people, how to be respectful of your elders, how to conduct yourself, to be honest, to be truthful. Uh, so although my mother wasn't Muslim, she taught, you know, many of the things that Islam teaches us, how to have akhlaq and how to be a good human being. Uh, but it wasn't until later on in my life when my grandmother and my grandfather came from Guinea that the environment began to change. Up until that point, there wasn't any uh, West African match established in Philadelphia. So when my grandmother came and my grand uncle came, they were like, no, we have to stab something for our community. And they began building a masjid. My father began, became more serious about Islam and he sent us to school. So my first uh, introduction to Quran was from my grand uncle, my great uncle, my first Quran teacher. Um, and then I went to Jamia over in Philly, uh, 45th Street. We began studying Quran with Sheikh Khalil, rahimahullah. And we gave him a very hard time. We just wanted to play, play football, run around. You know, so we didn't really appreciate what he was trying to give to us. And then from there, I started studying the AICP, uh, which is the first introduction to Aqidah and Shafi'i Fiqh and all of these things. And believe it or not, from there, I went from there to like the whole Salafi Wahhabi movement. <laughs> so just around around a circle. But look at the hikmah of Allah, because before I went into that movement, I was grounded in Ash'ari Aqidah. You know, so I, I even though I didn't know that's what it was. And I was grounded in Shafi'i Fiqh, even though I didn't know that was what it was, that I was just taught that those things. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I appreciated this the scholarship of the of our you know Salafi brothers, how serious they were about learning books, about the circles of knowledge, about revering the scholars, about upholding the sunnah of the Prophet, or what they understood to be that. Uh, and I went through that period. And then at a certain point, I got burnt out. 
and was like, this isn't it. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't find myself growing spiritually. And what happened to me was uh, at the time I was doing poetry, I was featured on HBO, I was doing CNN, getting some popularity in the city. And then, um, and then uh, Imam Shadid Muhammad actually from over at UMM called me to his office one day and invited me to do a khutbah, to write a khutbah. So I told him, ma'am, I'm not trained in giving khutbahs. I've never done it before. I don't think I'm qualified to do so. I know myself, you know, I'm not the person that should be doing that. He was like, okay, you don't have to give the khutbah, but you should at least write one. You should, you know, put your Arabic skills to use. You should write a khutbah. So I, you know, en engaged him. Sorry, I just want to make sure my laptop doesn't die. And I, I wrote the khutbah. And then uh, like a Thursday or so before, he called me and was like, listen, I'm traveling. Nobody else is going to do the khutbah. If you don't do it, we ain't going to have Juma. <laughs> so I'm sick to my stomach. You know, I remember walking up to the masjid. I showed up late on purpose, hoping that, you know, somebody was going to give the khutbah in, in my place. And I heard the brother, you know, speaking in Arabic. And I thought he was giving the khutbah. He was giving announcements. SubhanAllah. So I ended up giving the khutbah. It was called uh, YOLO, You Only Live Once. And I was talking about the Dahriyun, there's people that during the Prophet Sallallahu time that believe they only live once, that they would never come and return. And, you know, so that same mentality just recycled itself. Alhamdulillah, the khutbah was a hit. I began for three years straight giving khutbahs all around the city, Philadelphia, Delaware, Jersey. But really, I realized that I didn't have any teski. I didn't know about teski at the time. But in myself, I could speak. I could read uh, the Quran. I could speak Arabic. Okay. But mahal wasn't changing, you know, like the things I was dealing with 10 years prior to, I'm still dealing with it. You know, now I'm on a stage where I go from Seth the poet to brother Imam or brother Khatib or whatever the case may be. And now people see you in a different light and you go from just being able to just pass by to being under a microscope. So all of your flaws, all of your shortcomings, you're on the stage. And I wasn't, you know, I didn't have anything to allow me to grow. So fast forward, I, I began doing some work at Masjid Allah. And uh, Imam Imam uh, Imam Farid uh, called me and one on for one Friday and said that um, I need you to cover Juma for me. I won't be able to do Juma. I said, Imam, no problem. I'll cover your Juma. But what's going to hold you up? And he was like, uh, I have some students in Egypt that I'm looking after, and I need to look after them before I can come back. So I said, Well, Imam, I want to study too. <laughs> I don't want to give khutbah the rest of my life. I want to study. He said, If you're serious, drop everything that you're doing right now. Forget about the khutbah and come to Egypt. I was like, right, right now? He said, right, right now. So I told him, I called my parents and they were like, listen, you have our blessing. And a week later, I found myself in Egypt. Uh, when I got there, I dropped my bags off. I said, I'm coming right back. I'll be back. Came back home, got rid of my car, got rid of my apartment, gave my clothes away, kissed my parents. And a, a month or so later, I found myself in Egypt, beginning my journey. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a very difficult experience for me. Because here I was, you know, thought I knew everything, thought I had a sound understanding of what Islam was. Because people were looking to me for if they needed understanding of the deen. And I was answering people, answering questions. And here I am realizing how deeply ignorant I was. So for the first two years, I really didn't learn a lot. It was mainly understanding, yo, you're ignorant. Oh, no, you're really ignorant. Oh, no, you're very ignorant. And I remember getting to Egypt and uh, I saw everything I saw, it troubled me. I, I saw the Shafi brothers doing kunut at Fajr. And I was like, oh, this is bidah, man. These people off the menhaj. They, you know, everything I saw, I saw, you know, the 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 the, 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 the dhikr at Masjid Ja'afat. I was like, nah, what's going on? They dhikrin in the Masjid at Hussein, people kissing the, the maqam. And, I, you know, I just saw some things and it troubled me. And I felt like I knew everything. Um, I remember one thing, I'll never forget this. Uh, one of the shuyuk came from Gambia, and they uh, they visit, they had some relics of the Prophet Sallallahu and Master Hussein. It was like a sword and some things that belonged to him, and they were kissing it, you know. And all, and I'm looking at them like, what's wrong with these people? Like, why are they tripping? Like, is this some stuff that belonged to the Prophet? Like, you know, they they're bugging. You know, I, I didn't I didn't get it, and I realized, uh, you know, and I and I said something. I said that, you know, he's dead, you know. And there was an old man there who said that. He said, no, he's not dead. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is alive and you're dead. And it really shook me. Like it hurt. It, it felt like a, a punch to my solar plexus. Like, you know, what was it about my heart, about my being that I was troubled by people who love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I mean, if you look at, if you find a jacket from Elvis Presley, 
or if you find a, a jersey from Michael Jordan, I would put it in a frame. I would get it signed. I would pass it down to my son. I would take care of those things. But how did I, you know, respect and love Michael Jordan or Michael Jackson or whoever more than I had loved the Prophet So that was a real poor state. So it was then that I began to love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I found myself studying about his, his sirah, the shama'il and these things. I found myself attending different dhikrs. Even though I wasn't really with it, I was like, it, feel, my, my, it feels good to my heart. You know, my, you can't deny what the heart feels. So I was there like, man, my mind is saying, this is bid'ah, man, I can't get that. But my heart is saying, no, this is medicine for your heart. Um, so I went through my transformation. And really where things completely changed for me was when our, our teacher, Sheikh Zuhair al-Qazan, uh, al al-Jazairi, al a Jazairian scholar, he taught us this book called Waraqat. Uh, you know, and it blew my mind. That my first lesson in Usul, I'm like, yo, you don't know nothing about this deen. You know, I was the person that will come to you with Sahih Bukhari. Yo, the Prophet said this without no text. Allah says this in the Quran. English, by the way, you know, no text, not understanding the text, no context, no idea of how the verses are interrelated. Nasik wa Mansuk had no idea. And I just like, yo, you are so ignorant, man. You know, so I became so my idea was there were some brothers at the masjid that said, we're going to give you some money to go for a year, come back, and you can be the imam at one of the masjids. I was like, I bet. I'll go study for a year. I'll become an alim, and I'll be back. And when I got there, I was like, nah, this ain't it. Like, it's not going to, it's gone. It's not a year of work. So one year ended up turning into six, going on six, seven years. And after the first year, the brother's like, yo, you said you was going to come back. I said, I can't. I, I didn't learn anything. I'm ignorant. So, that you know, and I'm like, this is not humility. This is, like, real stuff. Like, I really don't know nothing. I have no idea. So I study Arabic, um, enrolled into the uh, Al Asar, the Mas Master University, the uh, the traditional Asar. Finished the program, then I enrolled, in, uh, enrolled into the Kulia, uh, which is Kulia Sharia, and this is where I'm finishing my studies now. And um, I, you know, was introduced to the different people of Tasawwuf, the different ulama. You know, got to sit with Habib Ali, Sheikh Muhammad Al Haydara from Gambia, all these different people that really affected my my character. And so the past years, I just like was really unlearning all the, the, the poor things that I thought I knew about Islam, really learning to refine my character, learning how to love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and just how to be a better human being. So my thought, my niya went from, I'm going to come back and be a teacher and be an imam, so I'm just going to remove ignorance from myself and benefit my own family. So I really did, I had, I lost all my desire from teaching, from, didn't want to be a khatib anymore, just... I didn't want to be involved in any of those things because I'm like, uh, as one of our teachers said, that when you're teaching people, you, you're not only transforming information, but you're transforming your hide, you're transforming your, your state. So I'm like, I don't want to give people my state. You know, I, I, I rather just try to work on myself first. And if I can benefit my family, that would be sufficient, uh, sufficient enough. Uh, so that's that's been my journey. And now I'm here uh, working, trying to benefit myself and my, my, my family, as well as benefit my community by doing actual work. Um, and uh, benefiting the youth by my way of my gift of poetry. That's something I feel confident, confident in. Um, yeah, that's that's my story in a nutshell, you know. And I thank Allah for people like Imam Amin, who was one of the, the, the very few Imams that has always been in my corner, encouraging me, supporting me, you know, uh, actually supporting me financially. And so you don't really understand what it's like to, to be broke until you're a student of knowledge and you have no means of income. And, you know, uh, I remember the times where Imam I mean, looked out for me. He didn't know, but I was on my last leg, like, you know, eating kushari every day. And Imam came through with a couple of Benjamins. And I was like, oh, man, we good. We're going to have some some lamb tonight. <laughs> but that's how essentially that's how the whole soup story happened. After my first year, I ran out of money complete. I was, you know, flat. So I was like, how can I make some money? So I went to the souk and I started buying fabrics and making suits. And I started making suits for other students and the kuli and stuff like that. And I became known for like making thobes and making suits. And that's how I would, would pay for my classes and stuff like that. And then when they went back home to the respective countries, they would tell people about me. And that's how I got a, you know, a little business started that would uh, that allowed me to provide for myself while I was studying. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. You said your father was Mandinka? Yeah, my father's Mandinka, yeah. Alhamdulillah. We have some connection. You know, my wife is Mandinka. Ah, mashallah. Is she uh, Konyaka or Bambara? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's you know different different types of Mandinkas. Uh, in, in Guinea, we are mainly Mandinka, 
Konyaka. Um, and that's where my parents is from. Okay. Yeah. I'm not that familiar. So. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah she's, from, you already know that she's from Gambia. Gambia. So, yeah, mainly Bambaras. The thing about my thing is, like, they travel all around. So, uh, we're the same people. Just as they travel, they picked up different dialects. But I know Bambara is different from like the, the, the Madinga that we speak, but it's, it's it's similar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You ma'am so, Otis, I look, you look like you were about to say something. No, I'm just. I, I was, was I was yeah. I, I was enjoying the thing. I, I was waiting for you to have some questions. If not, I'll jump in. If you know, he spilled a whole lot. That's a lot. That's like a two week program, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot of information. Yeah, you can go ahead because I'm about to go make a lot myself. Okay, all right. Uh, so, um, let's because you mentioned your journey, right? Mm -hmm. So, when you look at growing up, right? So, I want to go back to there a as a youth, uh, growing up with a, a Muslim father and a Christian mother, and not only growing up with African parents, original African parents, right? Mm -hmm. And growing up in the city of Philadelphia. So what was your home environment to the environment you had in the city? And how did you merge all that as a youngster? Yeah, man, it was, it was a uh, complete dichotomy. My experience at home, it was like, like two different worlds. And I remember growing up, like I re remember that people would tease me, of course, like, you know, uh, they had the whole African booty scratcher thing or whatever the case may be. So I became embarrassed of my heritage for a long time. I didn't want people to know I was African. So um, I remember one time I, I wrote this poem about that experience. And then my father, when he heard it, he laughed uncontrollably. And my mother, she cried when she heard the poem. And they were like, we wish that you could have grown up in your own motherland to see uh, the, 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 the tradition that you come from. And, you know, I was really, I had, so I had a, a bit of anxiety about that because, you know, bullies and stuff like that, people didn't understand the culture. I, I for a long time, I never spoke my native tongue. So I forgot a lot of the language. I, I didn't want to be caught uh, speaking it, um, you know, and then also this, the sweetness that I saw from my mother and my parents that, that kind of like, you know, gentleness they had, I couldn't carry that outside to others. I had a very gentle, soft disposition. You know, I respect respectful disposition. When you're out in the streets of Philadelphia, you can't carry that around with you. You got to be a lion. You know, so I, I struggle with that a lot. Like, you know, I remember like my first fights or whatever. I didn't know. We were taught like, you don't put your hands on other people. You know, you got to do this, roll up on your cap. You're like, yo, what I'm going to do? Like, my parents told me not to do this. Like, I got to defend myself. So I struggle with that a lot. But at a certain point, I just had to catch up, you know. Uh, and going back now, I was in Philadelphia visiting my mother not too long ago. I don't see anybody I grew up with. You know, all of the young men of my generation and women are either dead, dead or in jail. You know, if you, the ones that you do see, they look like they're 60 years old, you know, and they're only 25, 30 years old. Literally, I see young women that I seen when they were babies, they look like they could be my mother because of the, the, the you know, the environment, what it did to them. So I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Islam preserved me and even my younger brother, a lot of people don't know, got caught up in the system. He was a uh, engineering student, his last year at Lincoln University, came home, got caught up with some other young Muslim men, sent them away for 17 years. So I'm very aware of the blessing and the, the rahmah that Allah Ta'ala had on me. And that's what really why I began to practice Islam so seriously. Not because I wanted to be religious or whatever, it was because I knew that if I didn't, I was going to either lose my life or lose myself. Uh, you know, so I began serious about holding onto the rope of Allah out of desperation because I didn't have anything else. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think a lot. And it wasn't until I got to Egypt when I went outside of my environment that I realized how backwards, you know, my environment was and how deeply it affected me. I didn't realize that, you know, until I moved to Egypt and I had a, a deep aggressiveness about me. You know, in Egypt, they talk a lot, but they're not really about that physical thing, you know. So for my first year, I was getting the physical fights almost every day in Egypt, fighting over everything. Because I felt like they were disrespecting me and like, you know, attacking my pride, taking advantage of me. And they do. But, you know, it wasn't worth beating up other Muslims. And, and, and they weren't ready, to, prepared to take it to the level that I was prepared to take it to. And at the end, they were like, yo, we Muslim. Like, we're going to fight with you, but we're not going to spill your blood over a couple of Janae. So I had to really look into myself and say, what's wrong with you? You know, why, what, you know, what, what made you like this? Why do you think like this? Why do you behave like this? And really do some tarbiyah. So they say, they say Misra stands for, uh, Mim Musiba, 
صاد في صبر الرائع دائن في رحمة so that's what I learned the, the, the best tarbiya for me was in living in Egypt dealing with people learning to have patience learning to control myself control my tongue control my hands overlooking thoughts you know it was an unbelievable experience for me I, I really came into manhood and you know while in Egypt and they said that all the prophets and messengers that came through Egypt ta'ab like they all had to go through some look at Sayyidina Musa Sayyidina Yusuf is a sunnah of the NBA or anybody that comes to Egypt you got to go through some some trials and tribulations to, you know to get that I went through the whole racism thing uh but you know growing up I, in Egypt I thought like I was going to come to the Arab world it's going to be like the Sahabas like you know I was going to find Abu Bakr or Omar and people were great akhlaq and all this good stuff and not to say people of Egypt are I, I met some of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life from the Oliya in Egypt but you know in any place you find good and you find best so I don't want to disparage those people but I just wasn't prepared for that city mentality you know um in terms of your what in your life prepared you because you had a lot of ventures you were off into yeah. you're talking about the clothing so that's an entrepreneurial spirit you you know did your poetry that's an artistic spirit you had the academic spirit yeah what what was your academic growing up in secular school or did you grow up just in muslim school or you did both i did both actually um i went to um for the beginning portion of my life, I went to Catholic school, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had a lot of trouble because, you know, even though I had both influences, I was definitely leaning towards my Muslim identity. So I remember, like, I, they was trying to get us to go to mass and I wouldn't be willing to take the uh, the communion and all the other stuff that they were trying to get into. And I remember one point, the lady, the nun was dragging me by my collar up the steps to go to church. And I yanked my collar from her and she fell down those stone steps. And I got what they call a uh, NTR, never to return to any Catholic school in the city of Philadelphia. And like, you know, like third or fourth grade because of that experience. So from there, naturally, I, I went to school in like the uh, um, public school. How did I got a good education from there? I went to high school at West Philadelphia High for my first year. I had a very rough time being from Southwest Philly. I fought almost every day until I met some Muslim brothers from 52nd Street. That held it down for me and you know will walk me home and that's really how i got introduced to dawah to salafia from those brothers that that really looked out for me and then from there i went to al-aqsa from 10th 11th 12th grade and that's really why i began to refine myself in arabic interest in learning the quran uh but just to be honest i, I thought i knew arabic until i got to egypt <laughs> i realized that man i wasted so much time like you know our islamic school system in america is jacked and this is not in our this is all communities. I remember graduating from that school. The only thing I remember was Adik Amama Shubak. Like, you know, out of, you know, I mean, talking about three years of studying Arabic five days a week for maybe two hours a day. Never learn, you know, you know, just the basics like uh, grammar, morphology, none, none of those things. Like, you know, um, because a lot of what happens is brothers, you know, just will put their wives that come to the country into the school and say, yo, teach them. And they're not even qualified to be teachers. So they ruined a lot of, of good potential by just wasting our time by not being qualified. And that's really what you see all across the country, unqualified teachers teaching. So I went back and I had a gripe to pick with the school. Like, listen, you guys wasted a lot of our time. Um, because what I learned in, in six months in Egypt, I didn't learn in three years in that school. You know, and I just saw the cycle continuing itself over and over again. So almost time. Yeah. Um, now let me ask you a question because you mentioned something when you were. See, I keep forgetting you. You're 30 years old now, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're packing a lot of action in a little yeah. bit of years, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you were first introduced to your Islamic studies, so you went through several stages. You mentioned with, with your parents. Yeah. Then with your your family. Mm -hmm. Then you got introduced to uh, Ashadi Shafri type yeah. of background from the uh, AICP. Mm -hmm. Then you went into the Salafi movement. Mm -hmm. Like, take us through that journey and what did that look like and how did all that mesh into, you know, what you're experiencing now? How do you, because you have a lot of, you know, hindsight they say is 2020, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you're going through it, what does it look like? And now looking back, what do you see? Because from hindsight, you can give instruction 
and advice is for the one who's going through it right now. This is true. Oh, I was I was telling the, the, the imams that um what I've learned is that I learned to have an empathy with our Salafi brothers because when I was going through that experience, it was my love. Uh, no, I can't say love. Just to be completely honest, it was my intention to preserve the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, to preserve the the, the Quran, the Haq of the truth of the Quran. So when I would be on my, you know, bid'ah bashing and stuff like that, it was like with the intention of this is the truth. There is a number of different sects and everybody's off it except us. And if we don't preserve the, the truth, nobody's going to preserve it. Right. It was that type of zeal. And I think that there's a great um, energy. There's a great effort there that if, if, if redirected in the right way, we can do a great deal. But I think what I see a lot of brothers that maybe have not come out of that movement or have come out of that movement, the approach that they take toward the Salafi brothers is not really effective. Um, you know, I, I rem for example, there was a brother in Egypt uh, who, one of my Tijani brothers, they were doing group dhikr. And I was very inquisitive. I wanted to know, like, yo, you know, what's the dalil? You know? And he told me, he was like, um, he says, uh, oh, Allah mentioned doing things in jama'ah is good. And he mentioned dhikr. So we put dhikr, the two together. And for me, that wasn't sufficient. I'm like, yo, that's not the answer I'm looking for, whatever the case may be. And he kind of like wrote me off, you know, but I was genuinely inquisitive. So now that I know what I know, I can deliver it to people in a way that's accessible to them, utilizing the resources that they agree to, utilizing the scholars that they agree to. I can approach it that way. Um, but for me, I, I really what uh, attracted me to Dao to Salafia was like how studious the brothers were. Like, you know, they were very studious. Everybody was on not, and, and this is different from like you. You find like maybe perhaps amongst that shayir or you can say amongst ahl sunnah jamaah. There are different books. There are people studying from different scholars. There's no un uniformity. But if there, every you can go to any masjid in the city. Everybody's studying from this one book. Everybody has this one understanding of the book. Everybody is parroting, communicating the same language. So it was in unison. So you know we felt that we were a part of one uniform flow. Uh, so I really appreciated that and I admired that. Um, and I, but I, I never had any idea of that I was missing anything. So, you know, later on when I began to realize like, wait a minute, there's a whole portion of my religion that's missing. So what I do now is when I go to different communities, for, for example, I was in speaking to a community and I mentioned in a poem, I said, um, uh, it's always sunny for the Sunni. I strive to pray for my inner garments and they say I am a Sufi. And those have never been my words, but if I ever were, I would want to be somewhere in between Jalal ad Rumi and Asayuti. Yesterday's garments fit me loosely. I am changing into brighter colors. I am turning over new leaves. And, you know, there were some prominent brother, brothers from our Salafi community there. And when I said Sufi, the whole room was like, oh, he said Sufi. You know, it was that type of thing. And I, for, I, I've i been away for so long, I forgot where I was at. Like, I was in my in my vibe. And afterwards, the brother was like, yo, you know, Yusuf, you're one of our own. We love you. We hate to see you going astray. We don't want to say anything, but we've seen pictures of you with Habib Ali and these other different people, you know. We worried about you. We know you and us are you, you with the Ash'adis and all this other stuff. So we worried. So what I said to them was, I said, um, to the young and the young, younger brothers were around, I said, listen, you know, can we all agree about the hadith of hadith of Jibril? So yes, yeah, this is hadith. This is uh, mentioned in these hadith books. We all know about this hadith. So I said, can you can we agree that when Jibril alayhi salam, after he presented these three different things, there were the sciences of al-Islam. He mentioned uh, Iman, he mentioned Al-Islam, uh, Iman, which is Aqeedah or Tawheed. He mentioned Al-Islam, which is Fiqh or Jurisprudence. And he mentioned Ihsan. So I said, for you guys, we all know you guys study Aqeedah. That's your thing. You know, Imam Tahawi, whoever you're studying from, you, you, you have your, uh, your Aqeedah. You teach people Aqeedah, you beat it down people's throats. Fine. Uh, ethnic Aqeedah, whatever the case may be. When it comes to Fiqh, you guys don't really follow madahib. But you say you follow Quran and Sunnah, whether it's by way of Albani, whoever the case may be. I don't agree with that methodology, but you guys have your fiqh to, according to your own understanding, the prophet's prayer described, whatever the case may be. So that's two portions of, of the three. So for the third, do you have a way of studying Ihsan? You know, the same way that you, the scholars, these different schools of thoughts have their scholars, they have the different things. Do you have a way? And they said, no, we never study Ihsan, we never study Tazkiyah, whatever the case may be. So I said, that's one third of your religion that's completely missing. So, you know, what are you going to do to fill that one third portion that's missing? Or are you going to live your entire life as a Muslim, as a believer and die never having studied that portion of your religion? And I find that it gets them engaged. It gets them to think. 
So when I'm dealing with them, I just try to think of myself at 21, 22, 23 years old and how would I have wanted somebody to deal with me and give me this information. Um, you know, so that, that's what I try to do. But I, I so told the brothers, Imam Amin, I don't know if you heard, but something that was life changing for me was when I learned the book of Imam uh, Juwaini Oraqat and that book of Usud. It really blew my mind. It put in perspective like you don't have any rights to be talking about Allah saying the Quran and the Prophet says this. It put it put me in my place and I understood why we need a mujtahid, why the purpose of the method, madahib, that, that systemic way. So I just try to engage the brothers like this, like perhaps you should read this book or we can have a conversation or teach me, educate me, because maybe I don't know. Maybe I am misguided, whatever you say I am. So teach me, educate me about what you know. And then they're speaking about things. You can poke little holes in it and present it in a way that we're learning together. You know, like, oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know, so I do study circles with them and we talk together. So I just really think Allah, knowing what I know now, I wish that I had known it back then. And now the brothers are coming out the cut like we've been on this for 20, 30, 40 years in Philadelphia. I'm like, where was y'all at? Like, why is the Sunnah Jamaah so quiet? Well, you know, I mean, he's a, he's a firecracker. Like, he's the only one out there, you know, knocking kufis off, you know. But the rest of, you know, people are very low key, very meek very quiet about the truth. And as a young man, if somebody would have just took me by my hand, I would have, you know, of course, Allah Ta'ala is the best of planners, but I could have been very further along in my journey had I had some tarbiyah, had I had some taskiyah, I would have been a different human being and Allah Ta'ala knows best. But that experience allows me to know what I know now. I can reach back and, and try to, you know, lend, extend a hand to my brothers and sisters that are still caught up in that. I'll give it to the other imams in case they have questions. And if there's any questions from um, uh, everyone in the attendees, you know, please feel free to put your questions, inshallah. Because I think this is, I think we can all agree, our brother Yusuf, mashallah, he's a very articulate individual, very focused, very has his head on his shoulders. And those things in our communities we should celebrate, really. You know, that's something that, I, you know, I, it brings joy to my heart, you know. Uh, so... Let's let's engage in that, you know, and 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 have our youth listen to that as well, because, you know, I want to come back later to the other aspects of you know, you, the things you're engaged in. I think that is directly related to the youth, but I'll give them the other imams first, inshallah. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, I have, um, I have wrote I have read a piece that you wrote. I think it was on your page, and it was kind of um, describing like your journey. I guess since you've been over there, and I, as I was reading it, and I was like, "Man, this young man is going through a whole transformation." And I was really yeah. impressed yeah. because when I you know heard of you before, I mean, I mean, my daughter was saying you know about the poetry, and I listened to some of your stuff. It was really good, and I already assumed like you was this big personality, you know, like. And you, I mean, you were, you know, what I mean, we can give you flowers, man, you know. <laughs> and uh, but I, you know, but now here in this journey, like you know, just being open and in, in this discussion and saying, like, you know, you weren't where you thought you were, and um, you were, you know, you were just a regular, regular person yeah, who yeah. was kind of, you know, propelled into this uh, position. And uh, alhamdulillah, you didn't, you know, it didn't overwhelm you, you know, and um, it kept you balanced. Um, so when I was reading that story, I can't, it was like a couple years ago, but I was like, wow, man, it was like, it was a beautiful, you know, uh, story that you said. So may Allah come with Allah bless you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got one question. Um, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, you know, you were talking about the, uh, like the selfie movement and, you know, how we concentrate in Philadelphia yeah. and uh, in, in Delaware Valley. We have a lot of young people from from my experience that people are you know claiming to be Muslim, but then and, and even with older people that they're not actually being like like religious. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying like I mean we get so many cases where people everyone's giving you salams and they're Muslim and they're claiming Islam, but then there's just so many things that's taking place like you know where you know what what's going on how how are you engaged in this kind of stuff? So what I would uh, my my question to you is like. What advice would you give to like some of the young people to help them really be more in tune uh, with the religious aspects of their deen instead of just, you know, claiming to be Muslim by name? Uh, you know, I was reading this ayah that's often um, uh, that's written on top of Masajid. You know, you go to different across the countries is that. Uh, 
right? Um, that that salah essentially it, it it does away with uh with bad habits, what munkar, right? You know, so if a person is praying, essentially your prayer is supposed to remove bad characteristics and bad habits. So for me, I was praying, you know, I was praying for years and my character never changed. I was still, I was still the same person. So the, the, the scholar told me that that's a sign that your prayer is not accepted. So many of our elders, they're telling us like, I remember like, yo, y'all gotta pray and y'all gotta do these things. But the things that we're doing, it wasn't, it wasn't transforming our character. You know, it wasn't making us better. We were just praying, but it was empty prayers. So what I, and then at the end of the ayah, it says, what dhikru Allahi akbar that the dhikr of Allah is even greater. So I realized, like, subhanAllah, we know the status of salah, but if a person has a hardened heart, like many of us had, but by way of our sins, by way of our ignorance, whatever the case may be, telling them to pray, telling them to do these things is not benefiting them. If they don't know why they're praying, they don't have no connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forcing them to do the rich, these ritualistic things is not going to benefit. What helped me is the softening of my heart first. Is learning like, yo, it, make dhikr to clean your heart. I remember, well, I'm not going to lie to you. When I first started to make dhikr on my own, and, uh, you know, one of the scholars said, you know, she taught me that if you don't have a sheikh, that you should do salawat. Wallahi, when I used to make dhikr, it felt like somebody, like taking a chisel and banging it against my heart. It, it was painful. Like, that, that's the condition that my heart was in. So I realized, like, giving me a khutbah, giving me a dust, teaching me a book is not going to help me when my heart is in that condition. And I would weep. I would cry. Out of like this, how painful it was to like you know to do to do the dhikr like you know so that's the kind of hearts that we're dealing with, you know. One of the shuyu came and they asked him, you know, what's the energy here? He was talking about like the Batan, Fari Dahir is the Batan, and he said these cities they have a great darkness. So you know we're talking about the real the, the unseen of our of our situation. It's a great darkness that we're living in, and that darkness it affects our hearts, it affects our spiritual states. So we're calling to people and telling them do these do these things, teach aqidah, teach and fiqh. But the hearts are, are like stones. Bel adal, as Allah Taala says, even harder than stones, because even the stones love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even the stones make dhikr. These these hearts don't even make dhikr. Don't even love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that Jabal. That the, the, the Uhud is a mountain, I love it, and we and it loves us. So even the mountain is made of stone, loves Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But my heart, I didn't love the Prophet like that. Didn't think he was a big deal. As a Muslim, maybe 20-something years of my life, nobody ever taught me how to love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So my approach now when I'm dealing with younger people than I is just to teach them about love, how to love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how to love his personality. One of the young men, he told me, he said he wanted to be an atheist. He made his mind up, right? I'm going to be an atheist. I'm not following Islam. And then a few weeks later, he called back and said, you know what? I can't be an atheist. He says, because to be an atheist would mean that I'm calling Muhammad a liar. And the things that you taught me about Muhammad, I love him so much, I could never say that he's a liar. So that, therefore, I, I can never leave Islam. So it was the love of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that kept them connected to the, to, to the deen. So I just try to, you know, really en en engage them from a place of love. Uh, by purifying the heart, and then from there you can introduce different things about introducing them to who was Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, as and that was the way of of the Prophet Sallallahu which is that he taught Tawheed for 13 years before you know before other things were introduced. But in our city, somebody takes Shahada, the first thing you do is give them a kufi, give them a thob, tell them about the five daily prayers, and, and tell them what they're supposed to do, and it's like a burden on them, and they check out, and then they leave the masjid, you never ever see them again. Whereas that tarbiyah teaching about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a way. Okay, this is enough. Okay, thank you. Um, so that, that's the way uh, I, I try to engage by way. The, the, what affected me, which was dhikr, learning about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then learning the pieces of knowledge that can help me change. Like, uh, there's a phone company in Egypt called Iti Salah. I remember, you know, when all the students are always looking for the best phone companies. Uh, so uh, there was, a, I love the name Iti Salah because I saw the word Salah in it. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to choose this company based upon that. And I realized that salah is supposed to be like a connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while I was doing my own self-imposed tarbiyah, I would envision my prayer as like a phone call between myself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, the salah, like the adhan, hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, calling you to prayer. And if I missed it, I would, you know, like somebody you love, you will call them back, right? I would make my prayers, I would call back. You know, so I began to see my salah as a as, as like a phone call. And if I missed that call from somebody you love, you know, you would always pick the phone, 
back up and call them. You would never want to miss their phone call. In fact, if you really love them, you will be waiting for the phone to answer their calls. You will call them first by way of your supererogatory prayers. So, you know, I really begin to understand my prayers differently, understand the dean differently. And then as I begin to learn more, uh, it really, it really truly, truly transformed me. And I'm still going through that transformation now, but I'm grateful for those that had patience uh, with me and, and, you know, with my ignorance. Uh, and some of those other students too, you know, that I wasn't, I was really, really uh, opposed to the Madahib, opposed to the Ashali uh, Akida. I was opposed to all of these things. And I had no idea why. It was just something that was parroted to me. And the brothers had a lot of patience with me, taking me from step to step. Alhamdulillah, we're here now, still on, on the path, still trying to, you know, learn. Yeah. You have something, Imam Naim, before we take these questions? Yeah. My question is sort of like hypothetical because, and it relates specifically to Philadelphia. And I think a lot of us, we mention Philadelphia a lot because it's an important city. It's one of the black meccas in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you know, I'm from originally from New York and I lived in Philadelphia for five years. So I, I kind of like looked at Philadelphia, you know, as an outsider and living there, I seen so much potential. I mean, yeah, potential with a capital P, underline, all caps, bold, right? Yeah, but I feel like the people that live there who are from there don't see that potential. Yeah. And so my question to you with that in mind is if Allah was to give you some authority, mm -hmm. even if that authority doesn't have a title, in other words, people in Philadelphia listen to what you say. Yeah. What would you do? Or what would you institute in order to change or, or, or improve or have Philadelphia re uh, realize its potential? Wow, that's that's a huge question, you know. And some a lot a lot of times I feel guilty because I went and spent so much time away and I didn't go back to my community. I'm over here in, in Georgia, so I feel very guilty going back to Philadelphia. And sometimes like that shame keeps away from going from home and visiting different messages because they're looking at me like, yo, brother, what happened? Like, you know, so I do feel that that need to go back and give to my community. But I feel as though, and that's why the mentorship of, of, of you, Iman, I, I take it very seriously because I don't know even how, like, you know, they say to eat an elephant, you have to start by taking a bite. But you you brothers have been doing the work for years. I'm just coming home. I'm a fresh soldier ready to enlist, but I don't even know where, there's so many wars going on, where do I start? But uh, I think one of the things is that I, I understand is economical empowerment. I've been go, d digging deep into financial literacy. I mean, Allah, Allah has put in my, my circle some really wealthy brothers that are very young, brothers that are younger than me, and they're 20, 28, 29, 31 years old, and they're multi, multi-millionaires, utilizing digital marketing, utilizing social media. So just learning about financial literacy, um, and that way it can free us up. Many of the problems that we have in our city from crime is because people are poor, they're living in poverty. So you, meant, you mix financial literacy with edu knowledge of self um, about who we are as a people. One of the greatest things that we have done um, that happened to me, my experience is learning about the rich tradition in West Africa. When I got to Egypt, you know, I thought that you could, if a person wasn't an Arab, that you cannot take true Islam from them. And I got to Egypt, to Ushar, and I realized the top students and all across the board in any kulia were the West African students from Nigeria. Nobody can tie the shoes in the, the Nigerian boys from Kano. They come already memorizing every book of fiqh in their repertoire, memorizing Quran at the age of eight years old, fluent in Arabic, talking about studying uh, Jahili poetry by the time they're 12, 13 years old. One of the greatest students we have, crash graduate of Ushar, uh, Imam, uh, Imam Fozi Konate, he had a, a, a gathering of Ushar that had over 1,300 people. They haven't seen those numbers since they saw that Jafri maybe 40 years ago. You know, and he's a young brother from, uh, from, uh, from I believe, not from Ivory Coast, from I believe from Burkina Faso. And he, he was an alum already bef before he came to Ashar, you know. And he just said he's not leaving Egypt until, you know, um, he becomes the greatest scholar in Egypt. 
But he said, when I was 18 years old, I thought I'll be the next Imam Malik. And then at 19, I realized I couldn't be the next Imam Malik. So I tried to be you know, one of the greatest scholars in Egypt. They had that type of mentality. So rubbing shoulders with these young men, I'm like, yo, where y'all study at? They're like, we studied in the huts with our father and our grandparents, you know? So I realized like, wow, I jumped over this great tradition of, you know, scholarship in Guinea, scholarship in Mali, went all the way to Egypt. When I realized right in my own family, I had ulama. I just met one of my uncle, Sheikh Ibrahim Kroma, a great alam of linguist, like, you know, a linguist. Like when I heard his Arabic, he was so fasir. I would almost cry like, Sheikh, I could have studied with you right in our village. I could have, you know, tapped in with you. And I didn't have to go through all the struggles I went through. You know, but I overlooked West Africa. So me and myself, myself and my, my brother, Mustafa Briggs, we did this tour beyond Bilal and it was unearthing all the this, the West African scholarship. Uh, you know, it's called, you know, taken from Professor Uthman Khan, who was the religious director at Harvard University of the religious department. He wrote a book called Beyond Timbuktu. So Mustafa Briggs wrote a book called Beyond Bilal talking about the black Sahaba, African Sahaba that were outside of Bilal, not this one black figure, but there were many. Uh, figures uh, mentioning the works of Imam Jalal al-Din al-Sayyuti, Rafal Shatnu Habashan, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, Sheikh Ibrahim al uh, all these great different uh, uh, figures and scholars that are never mentioned, you know, so that was really empowering for me. And something really very beautiful happened. We went to, I think it was uh, a Boston College or, or Harvard University, and one of the professors said, I know your last name. I know you. And I was like, how do you know me? This is my first time ever at Harvard. He said, no, we study about your family and our African studies. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, he said, go get this book from my shelf. The book was called An Epic of Old Mali. And in this book, I opened this book and I found my ancestor in this book, Fako Likruma. Now, growing up, my father would tell me, oh, you come from royalty. You come from this lineage. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we heard that already. Right. But here's this professor never met in my life saying, here is your ancestor in this book. The contemporary of Sunjata Keita, uh, who are the, the, the ancestors of Mansa Musa, who led the way for Mansa Musa to come, blew my mind. You know, so now I'm learning about my heritage, about the, the, what's, uh, the tradition, the scholarship that happened there. And I was like, wow, you know, if brothers, you know, and then when I tell this to other brothers that look like me, they're like, nah, man, you on that, you know, there, we, there's no color in Islam, there's no culture. And I'm like, here, Allah said He created us in different tribes and nations. If you don't know yourself, how you how are the people going to know you? So people are opposed to that kind of language, even opposed to the idea that there's black ulama, there's black scholars, and possible mustahil. So that was another transformative thing for me. Like, wow, there's African ulama. You know, there's not only in Bilal the Arab, but I can go to Africa, I can go to Guinea, I can go to Senegal, I can go to Gambia, I can go to Burkina Faso and find scholarship that you won't find nowhere else. I'm talking about, you know, so I was like, man, this is something interesting. So, you know, those are the things that I wish to impart. So your, to your question, uh, Imam, knowledge of self, uh, first of all, financial empowerment to gain of knowledge of self, which is hasab and nasab, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, I would say uh, Islamic empowerment to really, you know, this ain't no ansari and we ain't set tripping or whatever, but, you know, likuli kubu min had. For every qawm, there's a guide, you know? So we have to really look at our own ulama, look at our own West African scholarship to see about our own people, our own self, our own history, our own tradition. You know, we're the only people, and I'm, I'm speaking to my own teachers, you guys know this better than I, where different peoples can come from different communities and preach to our community. You will never find uh, all Pakistani community, or all Arab community, all Bangladeshi community, and one of us are leading and teaching in that community. It would, it's not really appropriate. In those environments, or in Pakistan or India, you will never find it ever, you know. But for us, different people, different come and they educate us without knowing our condition, without knowing who we are, where we come from, our sicknesses, you know, our our dispositions. Uh, you know, we they don't have that kind of background knowledge. So it's financial empowerment, knowledge of self, uh, African centered. Uh, a, a way of approach to the dean. Uh, I, I would I would do those things, and I would incorporate the zawiyas. We have too many masajid, all right? Multi million dollar masajid, and they're ghosts. And the masjids have become a social club for the righteous instead of hospitals for the sick. You know, so I would like to have zawiyas where people could just come and get a healing. Like, listen, ain't no politics in here. You know, there's no set tripping in here. If you're coming here, you're coming to be healed. And to have qualified teachers that know how to deal with ahwal and nas, how to transform human beings, how to take a person from being 
uh, you know, oppressive people to having the gentleness of the Sahaba, how to refine people. You are alcoholic, ahlan wa sahlan, you're welcome. You are a, a serial fornicator, ahlan wa sahlan, you're welcome. You're dealing with gender, homosexuality issues, ahlan wa sahlan, you're welcome. Right? We're going to deal with you. We're not going to sugarcoat nothing, no politics. We're dealing with your with your estate. Right? You know, whatever the case may be, you're a chronic liar, ahlan wa sahlan, we'll deal with you. You know, so that kind of that kind of clinic for people's spirits, man, it's going to be it will be life changing. And alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to meet some people that have done that for me. Like, you know, don't fool with my, me, like know how to beat my nafs up, you know, and really get me in shape. And I was like, wow, I never knew that there was these kind of people around. Like, you know, other teachers, you can swig around them, but I'm meeting people that can look at, you know, they said the malakut of a person. I don't want to get too esoteric or whatever and tell you what your situation is, you know, so. Wallahi, I, I wish that we can implement those sort of things and a combination of all those things because if a person is broke and poor physically, you can teach them all you know the Islam you want, but they can't get out of that environment. It's not going to help them. So financial empowerment, um, spiritual empowerment, um, educational empowerment, and that's how you change communities. You know. Uh, you know Alhamdulillah. I, I want to ask an, uh, an attachment, an addendum to your answer. Another question. Because I'm pretty sure maybe a lot of people may not have heard the terminology before. But what's the difference between a masjid and a zawiyah? Oh, uh, yeah. So a masjid essentially is a, if you look in the word masjid itself, sajda is a place for sujood, a place where you pray. Um, uh, you know, things essentially, musalla is a place essentially where, where you pray. Or juma is to be hosted and imagine these things. And a zawiyah is mainly a place for education and a place for tarbiyah. Uh, so in a zawiyah, you'll find people doing a lot of dhikr doing a lot of education and that's what it's for of course you're going to make salah there when the salah times come but it's not focused on those things it's for a person to come and make dhikr and a person to learn the essentials of their deen uh so that's the kind of nuances of, of a zawi i would say hey sayyidi could you translate tarbiya because you're using the word oh, yeah like, sorry so yeah that everyone's familiar you know, no problem yeah. just so they they get used yeah. to these terminology i'll write it yeah. and you can translate yeah, so tarbiyah is essentially like a, a raising, acculturation, a, a refinement of something. Like Allah Ta'ala is Rabbil Alameen. He's the one that, uh, that sort of takes us and nourishes us and reforms us and refines us. So a murabbi, a person, a, a sheikh or a scholar, whoever the case may be, refines a person, uh, you know, takes their good characteristics and refines them and removes the bad away from them. Uh, one of my teachers recently told me, he said that in this dunya, there's no such thing as a person that's all good or a person that's all bad. It's a mixture of both. So he said, if you find an individual who has a lot of good and a little bad, then you take the bad out of that good and you remove it to the side. And if you find a person that has more bad than good, then you take that little bit of good and you remove it to the side and you leave the, the, the greater body of bad. But if you try to reform a person and change all of their badness, you won't do it. Or if you try to take a person and, you know, make them all good, you won't be able to do so. You just take whatever a person is working with and refine that person. So uh, tarbiyah is that act of refinement. Um, and it's best, like in at all, all, all schools of thoughts, you have scholars, you have teachers, you have shiuk. Even the Prophet Muhammad himself was taught by Jibreel, alayhi salam. he had a teacher. Sayyidina Musa, alayhi salam, had khidr, he had a teacher. So, you know, one of the mistakes I made was trying to do it on my own. And I did it by way of muraqaba, which is like, looking at myself i was at, for the first time in my life i was living by myself for years at a time it would just be me myself a couch and a quran and this i had all the time to look at myself and be like man you got some ugly characteristics about you you have some sicknesses about you and i would write it down in my poetry to take mental note about it and then i would try to like make myself better but i realized it was too difficult to do it on my own so i, I started to look for help for somebody that could help me make myself better you know Yeah. Get some of these questions, inshallah. Uh, uh, where they at? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Okay, I'm going back up. All right, we're there. Here goes the first question. Can you see it, Sayyidi? Yeah. What would your advice be for youth age 21 with regards to pursuing the study of his deen? Uh, where should he start here? In U.S. or another country, I'm impressed, mashallah, by the Muslims of Egypt. What I would say is that uh, is that is the Sunnah of the scholars that they would start in their homelands. One of the biggest mistakes I made was uh, overlooking 
people like Imam Naim, Imam Fahim, Imam Amin, and thinking like the grass is greener on the other side. You know, when really, you know, we don't praise people just for the sake of praising them, but it's true. These are men are great people of knowledge, of deep knowledge that have a deep understanding. So when you get, when I got to Egypt, I found myself starting from ground zero. Like I'm studying, you know, uh, uh, what's the book, uh, the first introductory book of Nahu. Uh, Adrumia, like these books that I could have studied years ago with, with my, my teachers here, you know, these introductory books, understanding a method, just basic knowledge that I wasted a lot of time. And I, I, if, if I could do things over, I would have sat down with my elders that could explain it to me in a language that I understand and gave me gems that I couldn't perhaps got over in Egypt. I remember it took me a long time to because their books are being taught in a different language. So now you have to understand the language, understand what's being said, understand the different contexts. And there's things sometimes that go lost in translation that you just don't get. You know, so I wish if I could do it over, I would have studied with these brothers. But I didn't really have an appreciation from people. I admit, Now coming back, I'm looking at people in my community like, wow, we have some gems here. You know, we had uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, Sheikh Okasha, some, uh, you know, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Hadi, my first Quran teacher. You know these different imams that they were in my in my immediate environment, but I didn't I didn't know how to appreciate a scholar. I thought a scholar was a dude in Saudi who had the the red and white gutra and had the thing that goes around the turban, a white crispy white robe. If you didn't look like that, you weren't an official scholar. You weren't an alim. You were imam. You were ustad maybe, but you couldn't be a scholar. Scholar, you couldn't be an alim. And it wasn't until I I, I studied for myself and I began to look back. And I was like, wow, we have ulama in our own communities, in their own rights. So I, I would recommend a young man or a young woman to benefit, to drink up as much knowledge as they can from their own environments. And when they can't get any more, then go out. Because people think that studying overseas is a joke. It's, it's difficult. It's not a game. And you're, you put it, you're, you're, especially in light of what's going on in the world now, you're putting your safety in jeopardy. My younger brother was in prison in Egypt. He got locked up. Uh, I know a lot of brothers that got deported, a lot of brothers that that physically got, you know, uh, uh, beat up and harmed. You, your finances are in jeopardy. You know, you know, it's, just, it's, it's a very difficult trial sometime and it's not cut off for everybody. Of many students that I saw come and go from Egypt, 90 percent of the students didn't make it through the program. They come and study, you know, they're half baked. So they study for six months and they never come back. And those are the ones that are very dangerous, you know, half knowledge. It's better to not know anything at all than to know a little bit of knowledge. Uh, so it's better for a person to finish books, complete books with our teachers here. And then if they feel like they're very hungry and thirsty for more, then they'll go elsewhere. And I would recommend that we open the doors to West Africa, to Gambia, to Senegal, to these different places. If you're coming from our communities, people that look like us, that know how to deal with us, um, I recommend that. Egypt, I never will speak down on Egypt. I learned so much in Egypt. And they are the best teachers, systematic teachers of Arabic language that I have ever seen. I've seen brothers come from China, from Pakistan, from Shishan, Chechnya, from all over the world. And six months rolling the Arabic. So they really have it down pat when it comes to teaching Arabic. And they're just, mashallah, overall, just amazing teachers. So, you know, the, the, the world is open. Um, but I would recommend, let's see what's going on in West Africa. Uh, uh, first, inshallah ta'ala, what's going on in the tradition. Even the way they teach Quran is different. You know, the Abba Jada, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, what's, uh, that's not how they taught me. You know, so they, like, my teachers that I'm learning from now, they teach Quran through Quran. So they don't say Alif, Ba, Ta, they start Ba, Bi, Bismi, Bismillah. So, you know, they teach Arabic through the Quran. Everything is, is centered around the Quran. So I'm like, wow, that's a very uh, effective way to teach the Quran. So, what well, is You live and you learn. Um, yeah, I see some other questions coming in. Yeah, they have some questions in the private chat. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to mention any uh, names, but from amongst the Salafi students of knowledge in Philly, have you engaged or had dialogue with any of them since your journey to so? Yeah, I have actually. Uh, just this weekend, when uh, and I don't want to mention any names. These are brothers I still to this day I love and I respect them dearly. Um, but now I feel like, man, when I used to come home, that you know people would embrace me. I had this love, but once I got into Azhar, I got like a little cold shoulder from some of these guys. Like you know, like yeah, you you you're not really from amongst us anymore, you know. Uh, and then some of them respect me. Like you know, I I know that you have the tools we can engage. 
but you know, it's like you off a little bit. And even some brothers say, Yusuf, I don't get you. Like, we don't know what you want. You know, we see you one day you would shake such and such, doctor such and such. Another day you would CD such and such. Like, what's going on? You you with too many people. Like, who you who you, who you rolling with? What set you claiming? And I'm like, listen, I'm just claiming leg that had a lot. Like, you know. So I try to be a bridge. Like, you know, I stand firm. I know what I what I'm what I, what I stand upon. But I can sit with anybody. I could be with anybody. I can go in any masjid. As long as you're welcoming to me, I'll be with you. I'll engage you. I'm going to do my thing. But I'm not so caught up in what I know now that I can't sit with other people. So as long as there's an invitation there, I'll pull up to any masjid in the city. You know, I go to, I actually sit with Nebuia, brothers from Nebuia. I'll catch them at breakfast. And we'll sit at the table and, and have conversations. Like, you know, and I'll listen. And I said, listen, you know, Shakes, y'all, y'all my teachers. I've studied this in us hard, but... I want y'all to clarify some things for me. You know, can you teach me? And I'm like, oh, you know that we don't believe in this because of that. And, you know, sometimes I learn different things. Like one of the brothers, I saw him, and he wanted, one of the students that came with me, he wanted to engage one of the imams from the masjid. And he was like, uh, it was about the the, the Shabi ayahs. And he was like, what's the um, what's the i'rab of the calf? And uh, they said, kemithli he shay. And a brother didn't know. I'm like, see, you embarrassed. <laughs> if you, you know, so I was like, okay, I see, you know, like, and I, I, I learned lessons from how to engage them. So I always approach them in a very humble manner, like I'm here to learn from you, like you know, like and, and deal with them in a way and find out where they are and and, and and give them little things to think about. Like, did you think about this? Have you reviewed this text? And sometimes they'll come back to me, like, yo, I never, I never knew that. I never understood that. Especially a lot of the younger students that graduated from Medina, like. They have never heard, they don't know anything about the Ashad Aqidah at all. They just know that we don't mess with it, it's there, or, you know, they don't know. So when I'm presenting basic ideas, one of the books that I love that Imam Amin gave me was Aqidah to Salaf. That's my, that's my safe right there, my secret weapon. So I'm pulling out Hadith of Ibn Abbas, like, okay, if you say that there's no tech will, what do you say about this? Like, educate me, I don't know. Like, I got this book from Imam Amin, like, you know, I, I don't know. Like, tell me, what, does, how, what do you make of this? And it's blowing their minds. Like, you know, so I love that book, by the way, because when, when the Salafi students from Egypt come to my house and they see Akita to Salaf, they're like, all right, yeah, he good. He got that Ghazali up there. He got <laughs> he got some other stuff up there, but, you know, he got Akita to Salaf, he good. But not knowing if you pull a book out, you know, there's, mashallah, some other stuff in there. So I just, I really, I, I, I try to be amongst the people. I don't try to ostracize anybody, even though the brothers that are around from us are, they, they hate the Salafis. They curse them. They may take fear of them and all the other stuff. And. And I was like, man, like, at the end of the day, when we are in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and standing before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he cried and begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save ummati, ummati. He says, I did, oh Allah, I'm not asking you for my for Fatima, my daughter, I'm asking you for my ummah. So we should never want to see one person from the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam misguided from his path. So that's how I look at it. Like, man, I don't care who shape you following, whatever you following, you are from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want good for you like I want for myself. And it hurts me to see you following something and you don't even know what you're following. So I, I approach it from that path. Like, I'm not going, I'm not here to fight you. I'm not even here to debate you. I'm here to give you love. Like, at, 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 at minimum, I'm going to teach you what I can teach you. We can engage each other. But just to, you know, to take a brother's hand and say, listen, man, you know, I'm, 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 we're going to go to uh, this path. I remember there's a brother on Market Street who heard me talking about this with some brothers. And he, was like, he told the brothers, like, yo, don't follow him. He on Bidah. Like, he going to call you to misguidance. And I saw him like a week later, and he asked me for some money. You know, he didn't recognize that it was me. So, you know, I gave it to him, sat, sat down, talked with him. And I was like, hey, do you remember? Like, I was the person that you said was on Bidah. He's like, no, no, I never said that. I'm like, yeah, you did say that. Like, oh, no, I didn't mean it. And so I was able, after feeding him, to engage him. Like, wow, these are things I didn't know. But if it wasn't for that meal that I shared with him, he would have been a brick wall to me. So sometimes it takes a meal, breaking bread with somebody, you know, making clothes for people. That's another way for me to enter the hearts. Like, you know, uh, you know, so I try different ways. Like, uh, and this is from the way of our pred- our ancestors that they would enter people's hearts by doing business with them, you know, uh, uh, selling things. So just different strategies, man, to unify Umar Muhammadiyya, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I think that was a similar question, similar to the previous one, but it had one like institutions of learning and formal education. Maybe you might want to. Uh, you said, what is the uh, learning institutions? 
No, this yeah, this is a question was similar to the previous one, okay. but it has a little different element. Maybe you want to look okay. at it. Uh, you know, I wish to embark the same journey as Islam, starting their formal education. What learning institution? Uh, if we're talking about formal Islamic studies, I would again recommend go going to see these imams. Do not look over these imams. And I'm not just saying it just to say it. Sit with people that look like you, that know you, that understand your condition, that have been where you're from, that know, that have been on the exact same journey as you. It's priceless. It's priceless. Wallahi, Allah is my witness. I, I, like to this day, I call I called the imam before, like a couple weeks ago, calling him and same thing for imam uh, Naeem, imam Fahim, because I want to go back and learn from them. Like there's certain things, this is a huge gap. That you can go to Medina, you can go to Ashar, you can go to Kirawain Institute, you can go to Zaytun or wherever. But there's certain aspects of the deen that you will not know until you take it from people that know you, that live amongst you, that understand your condition. So again, formal education, these imams are well trained and well qualified to give it to you. Uh, you know, So I would start there and then let them tell you, okay, Ashar is good for you or Morocco is good for you. Or wherever, or you know, you want to go is good for you, Malaysia, or whatever case may be, is good for you. Let them be the ones that tell you, okay, now you're ready. But if you just go on your own, like myself, you'll you'll like deal with a lot of hardship, you know. But if you have somebody to guide you, somebody to you know to sort of structure, you're learning like our brother Abdul Aziz. I, I was very jealous of Abdul Aziz, uh, you know, because he had that structure. He had that, you know, he was on point. He he wasn't going to left or right. He knew exactly his. His, his, his target and he was on it. But some of the brothers we come, we don't have any guidance. We just going left and going right. Or some of the brothers of guidance don't know what they're doing. They haven't traversed the path. It's giving us any old information. So go to your local imams, go to the imams that you know. If you're in this discussion, you know who they are. Study from amongst them, learn the books. And after you take as much knowledge as you can, if they don't have no more, then go elsewhere. So formal education, if we're talking about Islamic studies, these are your guys right here on this uh, on this on this platform. I, I I don't know anybody else that I can recommend. And that's really the sunnah of the ulama. They were studying in their own land before going elsewhere. Any scholar that you mentioned of Noteworth, uh, they, 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 they study in their own places before they went elsewhere. Nobody else did it backwards. You What you mentioned is like you mentioned Sheikh Uthman and Fodio. That's the system he learned in. They yeah. call it the Timbuktu model. Yeah. Right. You exhaust, you know, the teachers and you know, scholars in your family, you know, in your extended family, in your neighborhood, before you even think about going out. Yeah. Right? Many of times it's your, your mother, your father, and uncles, aunts, cousins, relatives, extended family before you go out. I also see it as a form of gratitude. It is. It sure. is. It is. How you have a, a netma, a blessing right there in front of you, and you ignore that, you skip that, and you go someplace else. Yeah, that's the way the human being, isn't it? You know? Uh SubhanAllah. Yeah, but may Allah Ta'ala rectify our affairs. And I think a lot of it is, for me, is just our own, uh, you know, lack of love for ourselves, lack of appreciation for ourselves. So it's like, you look like me and I don't love myself. So there's no way I can love you. I don't respect myself. So how can I respect you? I don't think anything of myself. So how can I think something of you? I'll call you Imam. But in the back of my mind, I had this inferiority complex. You couldn't be my Imam. You know, you look too much like me. You know me too well. You speak like me. No, nah, you can't be my imam. You can't. For, what can you give to me? What's a formal and, you know, I need formal in, uh, institute. No, I'm telling these imams right here, they, they'll give you the formal knowledge. Like, they have it. Uh, you know, so that's why I like to deal with my elders, like, because they is they know all, all your tricks. Like, you know, when I'm dealing with somebody, look like overseas, I can I can get, I can, I can run laps around some of these scholars, you know, but when I'm dealing with imam, you know, Naeem, Imam Fahim in the street, I can't get around them. Like, you know, game, game recognized game. Like, you know, like, you know, you can recognize a young man that coming to match that he's been smoking weed. You know what his eyes look like. Okay, you ain't got allergies. You just, you just rolled the blunt. I know what time it is. Like, you know, so you, you have to deal with brothers that look like you and know your situation, man. Know where you're slipping at. Know your weaknesses. Know your strengths and can capitalize off of that. Um, and that's the benefit. What you mentioned is deep because, like, I know none of us here are like tripping over our titles and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. But we notice, and sometimes we mention it, but we notice, like, with our people, for example, right? Our people, a lot of us, it's like an internal jihad to give us our title, Iman. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. But when that same person, when our people are interacting with other people that have titles or Imam or Sheikh, 
they never leave it off, not once. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They might even leave off their name, but they won't yeah. leave off the sheikh or the yeah. imam. Yeah. With us, right? Amongst us, right? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, like, you know, our supporters, you know, they be going at it with some people, like, you know, that's Imam Amin, right? You keep calling yeah. him Amin. I know you're cool and all that stuff, yeah. but that's our Imam, and yeah. we demand that you respect him. But it's yeah. like you said, it's a sickness amongst us. We like mm -hmm. that self hatred. We, you know, I hate myself. I don't like myself. And yeah. so, you know, you look like me. So by extension, I don't like you either. And that's I don't true. like you either. Yeah, it's true. It's going on. Now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Sister Samira said they even give titles to people that don't deserve it. The brother, a taxi driver. And he became sheikh as soon as he walked in the masjid because he, <laughs> he <laughs> brother he steady. I live bad tab, but he 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 man, just because you know, leave this alone, brother. You know, never study a book of touch weed in his life because he don't look like you, he's a man, you know. You know, Allah, Allah make it easy on us. Yeah. Uh a question here about uh modern times. There are many questions regarding financial empowerment, Bitcoin, all coins, NFTs, but etc. Uh, I know Sheikh Joe Bradford. This is his thing. This is what he does. Uh, so I recommend look look up show, uh, Sheikh Joe Bradford. Uh, and he's all about this. He has some great resources. And I think that in our communities, we really, really need this information. Uh, you know, it's, every time I go somewhere, when I meet young brothers, I'm always talking to them about credit, talking about ownership, talking about financial empowerment, all of that stuff, leaving will behinds, generational wealth. I'm really, really big on that. Uh, you know, and, and um, and I try to, I, I think that we need this in our communities more. Like even in, in the Masjid here, in Atlanta Masjid, I, I spoke to Imam Suleiman about this. I'm very discouraged. I know that in this very Masjid, there are brothers that pray with us and they do a million dollars a day in business. In this very same Masjid, there are brothers that pray with us that can barely afford to pay their rent, to pay their light bills. But the brothers that's making this kind of money, they're so quiet. Like, why else? Like, you know, let us know. This young brothers, we hungry. We got the energy. We have the talent. We have the mentality. Let us know. But y'all brothers get up there and y'all get real tight lipped with information. Be generous with your information. Let us know what you went through, how to build credit, how to, you know, how you ownership, how you buy properties. And, just, you know, nobody's talking about these things. So, you know, we really need that, man. You know, I remember growing up, I thought that being poor was righteousness. You know, I thought it was it was righteous. That was just part of, to, you know, uh, religiosity to be broke. And I'm like, that's, that's that's not it, man. That's not that's not it. So I wish that our imams and, and our teachers, like, I want to see our imams pull up to the masjid in their big body bands. Like, you know, I want to see imam, my imams dripped out, you know, because, like, they don't respect the young, you know, in a hyper materialistic culture society. That's a form of dawah. Like you know, if the if the drug deal on the block pushing a Bentley and I, my man pushing a Rav Four, no disrespect to the Rav Four, but it's like nah, I want, I'm a, I'm a, I, you know, I want to do what he's doing, you know. So we should, you know, be, have ihsan. Whatever is the best clothes of our society, we should wear the best clothes. Whatever is the best vehicle in our society, whatever metrics or rubric we use for the best vehicle, we should have that. Whatever is the best building infrastructure in a, in a building, our masters should look like that. That's what I, but that's Ihsan, you know, and that's the reason why I try to present this. I use the whole suit uh, uh, thing as, as a form of Ihsan, you know, because I mean, I mean, be flat broke, but I'm going to look like Jeff Bezos, though. I'm going to look like a million dollars. So when I step in, they say, yo, why are you dressed like that? Because I'm a Muslim and it creates conversation, uh, you know, so I just, if I can't have Ihsan in, inside Ihsan, at least I can begin with outer Ihsan. And hopefully as I'm building up my inner Ihsan, that the two one day will meet. Uh, so, you know, I remember when I was a young man that, yeah, I, I love to see the imam looking good, look, you know, looking fresh. As the young people say, dripped out. Man, I want to be like him. Like, you know, but if the imam got mustard stains on the stove, I'm like, nah, man, I, don't, I, don't, I ain't trying to be like that. You know, they don't respect scholarship. You know, the, 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 the kufi all worn out, bleached day. Like, nah, I don't want to be like that guy, you know. Uh, but if you look good, you know, you're fresh, you present yourself in the manner, the heba of imam malik. You know, imam malik will come through looking like a king. And people say, I don't know what you want, but I, I know that you demand my respect. And he said, it isn't about Malik. It's about the knowledge that I have. So I think as, as leaders and, and preachers that we should also inherit that. And that's already inside of us anyway. Yeah, I mean, we've been on that. But I think it should be with conscious effort, inshallah. Inshallah. Curry juice on the throw of, yeah, man, our brother, our, may Allah help our imams. <laughs> Indian curry at that. Oh, man, it ain't coming out. <laughs>
Here's another uh, question. Mashallah, they're engaging tonight. Alhamdulillah. Get it. <laughs> Some Muslims talk against uh, investing in the stock market and such. Is there someone who can teach Islamic position in this area? So, you know, uh, yeah, as I said, Sheikh Joe Bradford, he's he's very knowledgeable. But it's something that, if, if, if Allah allows me to do a master's, I want to do a master's in and finance, Islamic banking and financing, and, and figure out like these nuanced issues, like you know, how do we deal with them as Muslims and be at the forefront uh, of Bitcoin and all these other things. And you know, I think that we should be at the forefront of those things and engaging them and uh and you know, teaching our communities about those things. Like uh I know brothers that's taken like the funding that happens to match it and put it in, in mutual funds accounts where you know, or or a concept, right? There's a brother named by the name of Jamil, where, for example, a lot of the mashes that we have have a lot of land. So he will come and build mixed units housing on a master's property. And then that unit mixed unit housing will pay for the master expenses for life, pay for the salary for the imam and students for life. And they never, ever have to request donations again because the infrastructure that they build using land that was already available to them then pays for everything. So just those sort of things. And I introduced this to some of the brothers in the, in the West Southwest Philly community we're working on. They have so much land. And now with gentrification in these communities, you can build a housing unit and manage that housing unit. And the residual income from that will pay for the master for generations, will we'll take students out of interest-based loans. You could pay for a brother to go to college, to be a doctor, to be an engineer, for students of knowledge based upon one decision that you make utilizing assets that we already have. So those kind of conversations, walk up trust. Oh yeah, like those kind of things. Like you know, leaving will behinds. You know, I'm so tired of seeing brothers pass away and we utilizing GoFundMe's to you know pay people expenses. It doesn't make any sense. No will behinds. In fact, you know, we leave our children in debt. You know, so I've been having these conversations with my father about financial literacy, about some of the gaps that he had about leaving your children assets. But some of our parents say that I struggle. I had to get it, so my children got to struggle and get it. But when I'm looking at my colleagues, some people I went to college with, they they they're trust fund babies, you know, and they they they, they are they walk graduate college getting getting ten twenty thousand dollars every month for the rest of their lives, and they don't have to do nothing else. It's life changing money for us. So, yeah, I'm really big on that. That's what I as I've been home now, I've really been studying that, trying to put my put my, myself in places and spaces where I can learn about these things, and then pass it on to my community. You know, one question related to that, because where do you see if we act now, Where, what is your vision that the Islamic community in America, especially in Black America, looks like 20 years from now if we implement most of these concepts actively that you talked about tonight? Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to one of those concepts alone, financial empowerment. You know, the issue a lot of our community is poverty, massive poverty. Poverty drives crime. Poverty is taking away our young men, sending them to the, the prison population. But if we can create jobs for them, if we can create businesses for them, give them business plans. So what I'm doing right now, I'm actually in the office, uh, Iman Atlanta, Inner City Muslim Action Network. And what we're doing here is that we find brothers that are coming home from prison and we're paying them to learn a trade. You know, so we're paying them, you know, so these opportunities like, you know, so we're, we're engaged in philanthropy, you know, getting brothers that come out the prison population, getting them education, getting them, getting them jobs, getting allowing the opportunities to change their life, teaching them the right Islam. You know, scholars that look like us where we have in, in a master, you can pick 10 out of any 10, 20 uh, young men. They all memorize the Quran. They all went through a rigorous Islamic studies program or, you know, have an understanding of Aqidah, have an understanding of fiqh. They all are, you know. Like, you know, a basic knowledge. Everybody's at the same level. You know, then we can all uh, engage in higher studies, those that are willing to. But on a basic level, our community are highly educated communities, uh, you know, highly wealthy communities. Like, you know, where I see communities where they don't have donation boxes because there's no need. You know, there's, there's the five brothers in the community that we I'll take care of the light bill. I'll take care of this. I'll take care of that. And it's done. You know, so that having those kind of communities where there are multimillionaires, billionaires in our community, 5, 10, 20, 30 of them. And we all empower each other to educate the youth and set them up with businesses and things like that. Uh, that Those are the kind of things that I'm looking for. 
So, you know, for somebody like myself, I realized that as I'm coming back, I don't necessarily have to be Ustaz Yusuf. I don't have to be teaching books. But if I can teach my, my community financial empowerment, and then when you get the money, how to transform yourself and work on the nuts at the same time from the things I learned, that's a great jihad that's done right there. So I'm really, I, I, I'm really looking for where's the work? Like, what am I going to be called to do? Um, so that's, that's why I see the Muslim community. I think we're waking up 10 years ago, having a black imams round table, unheard of. Having an African-American conference with schol African-American scholarship, unheard of. You know, we wouldn't have, we would have been mad at you for doing that. Who we think you are, who we think we are to do that. You know, so there are things that are happening. People waking up to West Africa, people coming into understanding of themselves, people connecting themselves back to West Africa, back to our traditions. You know, uh, is dope. Is is it's happening? And we're waking up. Alhamdulillah. You know, people waking up from getting Salafi burnout. Like, man, there got to be something else. People embracing Tuskia. You know, I see people dickering out in public now, embracing. Tesquia, Tesawuf, you know, whatever you want to call it, I see people waking up. And the moment we really embody that as a community, it's over. And don't let me get started with Philly. The moment Tesquia really gets a hold of Philly, the whole Tesawuf movement, and, and not just the performative aspect of it, like people just want to hold a Tesbia and put the the, the <laughs> over their shoulders and have the def, you know, the the you know the sugar, the sugar kufis and all that. Once we get past the performative aspect and really do spiritual work. There is no city in the world I feel like that's going to move like Philadelphia is going to move. You know? I, I second I second your statement. Yeah. Because one of the, somebody asked me, they said, why are you concentrate in Philly and Philly and come, we'll be in Philadelphia this Saturday with uh, Hanifia Haven uh, yeah. uh, this Saturday from 11 to 6 in <laughs> South Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh uh, the same place where we always meet. Uh, what's the address? Let me put it. Shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, 1201 South 23rd Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from 11 to 6, March the 19th. Okay. Uh, uh, By the way, City Yusuf, I was waiting for Imam Mamin to say, but he ain't say it yet. We say to Sowif over here. To Sowif, okay. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. I told him it's open, you know. I mean, I just, that was his choice of words. See, listen, I'll give you an example. See, Farouk thought I'd have missed that comment. I'm being on my good behavior because this brother is smooth, right? <laughs> Sheikh Yusuf is smooth. Though he doesn't want to I mean, I love it so. Smooth. I love right? so. And I love that stuff. Like, I see great, great potential. Imagine him when he's our age, Allah. I mean, if everything's facilitated when he's our age, that means he got another 20 years of excellence with support. Woo! I mean, Think about that. Been long time. And then the young people coming behind him. So now if he get 20 years, Talk about that baby now, 20 years will be a scholar. He's 30. You're yeah, talking about yeah. 20. you dropping that down to 16, 17, 10, 9. Mm. Man, we on our way. So, like, we got to celebrate this stuff because we all knew to get a 30-year-old talking like this in our communities? Come on, man. Islam, Muslim, traditional knowledge, that's not easy. That's not easy. And I see his progress, right? Step by step, year by year, year by year. I watch and I say, subhanAllah, this is our dream. We mm -hmm. won't be saying, get out the way, old heads. We'll be gladly out the way because they are trained and they're well ready, right? And then we do our part as elders, guiding, right? And now we're talking about from when I learned and he's learning now and you go overseas, you saw that the elders are respected. They are, man. I was you, 70 and above. Big time, big time. Right? And even though the they're not really readily teaching, they're doing all that tarbiya. Yeah. While you got the other scholars teaching the durus, and that that's one thing, but we need in our community respected elders. Yeah. I think about it all the time growing up, 
no elders we respected, right? <laughs> like, you know, and I, and I, today I say, look where we're going. And I'm always reminded that we're doing a great job as a people. It looked sometimes dark, but when you look at the big sparks of light coming from our community, and he's one of them, and others like that, we got to find them, you know, like uh, uh, Ustav Noor Sanders. Look at the work he's doing, right? We got to facilitate that stuff. He got children that step. He got everything, you know, he's working. Muawiyah, you got brothers, Muawiyah in the same place where he's studying, in the same school, in the same Zawiyah. They rolling. These brothers, we got to facilitate that stuff for them, right? We have to. So I don't know how I got on that long spill. Oh, so I'm just talking about your smoothness. But here, like we said, as Farouk said, you know, I mean, Imam Amin is good, but his grass will get you itching, right? <laughs> Everybody got different styles, bro. I'm, I'm, hey, I got my way of doing it. He got his way. We put it together. We get the job done, right? So that's he why. Just said, you know, the new and improved Imam Amin without the need for sensitivity training. <laughs> I told you, my name is, new name is going to be on the show, Imam Old is Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Alhamdulillah. We're, we're, we're doing what we can. Uh, my question, oh, here's another question. You got this one. This is very important in Philly and, and, and other places, even here in Atlantic City, in Baltimore, all around the country. You want to tackle that one? Okay, uh, what do you feel about the killings in our inner cities with the youth in Maryland uh, and Atlantic City? And it seems like a shooting in Baltimore every night. Um, I think this generation is, is a new generation, even at, at 30, you know, I thought my generation was vicious. I remember growing up, Philadelphia was the murder capital. But now I'm just seeing a different breed of young people and they can have complete hopelessness. I remember going home where my parents live in Philly. There's a huge bush in front of our house. And like, you know, the stick up boys will always come and sit in front of my house because they can hide in front of the bushes and catch people off guard. So, when, you know, I came home one time and I saw them sitting in front of my mother's house. And, they, you know, they were like waiting for somebody to come around the corner. Two Muslims. So I reckon I knew them from the, when they were young kids. So I asked them, like, yo, y'all should take it down the street. And one of the young men said to me, he was like, I don't give a F about my own life. How do you think I feel about yours? Right? And he and they both were strapped. So I'm thinking, like, subhanAllah, you know, like and the, but the other young man who they both were high, he was like, nah, let's go ahead. Like, that's that's Yusuf. Like, you know, we know him as Seth. And, you know, let's take, get from from his mother's house. But I realized that in that very moment, they would have killed me and it would have meant nothing to them. You know, so I think I, I came from the last fighting generation. I remember we used to have fist fights, but that time is over with access to weapons, with the way media, the, uh, the media is portraying. De desensitizing murder is a different generation. So I think that, and I think it's also coming with the end of times. Uh, you know, one of the, the teachers was saying that if a person, it says in the eye of Ibrahim was looking in the Medakut of the Sama, Allah instructs us to look in the Medakut of the Sama. If you look in this, he said that you see that the, the, the last days are coming, the end of time is coming very soon. So that's a part of the last days when people will be killed and the person killed and the killer don't know why they did it. You know, so that's just the the, 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 the telling of what the Prophet told us what happened. Um, but I think a lot of that is also is poverty, is hopelessness, is drugs. Uh, you know, all intertwining, all finding its place and, and exacerbating, compounding over years. This is what's happening. So you got to get people off of drugs. You got to get people educated, get people to know themselves, to love themselves, get people jobs, get people money in their pocket. And a lot of those things would dissipate. Um, but until then, a lot of the reform work and things that you see happening, people aren't being rehabilitated. Even most of the people that go to jail, they're just becoming better criminals. Um, so I think we need a massive to so with movement to refine the hearts of people, man, because it's like cold. Like he said what he said, like, I don't care about my own life. I don't love myself. I could die right now and it makes me no difference. So how do you think I feel about you? And it let me know his state. I was like, wow, like he's being very honest and vulnerable. So, you know, I had to like lay off them. Um, you know, I was like, it's either going to be him or me because if I press him, I'm at either he going to take my life or I'm going to take his. Uh, so, uh, I wish I had the answers, but I, I, I'm hopeful that with the kind of transformation that I went through, if some of the young men could have those things, that they would, they would be, they would, it would, they would benefit. 
Uh, but I see the same thing all across the, all across the country in America when I visit different places. I see Muslims killing Muslims in Seattle, Washington, you know, back and forth and Philly and New York and D.C. Everywhere is the same thing. It's a sign of the last day. So we can just try our best to hold on and, and save as many as we can save. And then the rest, you know, we just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on them. Yeah. I want to question you about in terms of economics. Yeah. For us as a community and and it's and, and as a Muslim community, mm -hmm. in terms of entrepreneurship, careers, and jobs. Yeah. What are your thoughts about those three aspects? Because they're different entrepreneurship, careers, yeah. and just regular normal, yeah. normal jobs. So I'll, I'll tell, like what happened to me is that for, so I've been an entrepreneur for as long as I can remember. I had my first job at five years old. I used to lay carpet with my uncle Joe, with my mom's uh, cousin, and he would pay us at McDonald's, right? I know. <laughs> yeah, stuff for the love. Yeah, he had his eating meat. On top of that, he had his eating that sausage, man. It was pork, man. We didn't even know. He had his, he used to pay us at McDonald's breakfast, the, the uh, egg McMuffin and all that, all that, right. all that, all that stuff. So that was my first job at five. And as I got older, one of the things that kept us out of the streets is that we never had time to run the streets. Saturday morning after Fudger, my dad would take us out and we would work all day and come home so exhausted. We never even had time to get into trouble. So we were like doing plumbing, sheetrocking, tiling, painting, roofing, electrical work, all of that stuff. So, you know, we, we never had the time. Um, so I had the entrepreneur spirit. When I was 16 years old, my dad told me he would never give me money again. He said, if you want money, I'll show you how to get it, but I'm never going to give it to you. So I started selling cars. I used to go to the PPA auction, buy cars, and then flip it. You know, I remember having my first car at 16 years old, be able to save driving to school to Aksa. You know, so I, I had the entrepreneurial spirit. So even through Egypt, I was selling suits, doing my thing. So just coming back now, I just started to get into a career, you know, and it's a whole different realm for me. Um, like right now I'm doing PR work for a law firm for like, mashallah, for one of the fastest growing law firms in America. And it's very difficult on my nuffs, man, to have another man tell me when you're going to get up, when you're going to go to sleep, have your phone on at all time, do this, do that. You can't travel here. You can't do that. It's very difficult for me. But the information I'm learning, I always tell myself, this is not about me. It's about my community. The meetings that I'm in, like for the past four months, I was in meetings two hours a day with billionaire and millionaire firms, listening to them talk about business, about the problems they have, about how to structure, how to revamp their business. And they're taking advice from a young Muslim man at 30 years old. He's advising dudes in their 50, 60, 70 years old multi-million and billion dollar uh, individuals i'm like wow subhanallah like this is what knowledge is so he's uh he has uh you know mastery of that field the expertise of law firms and how to scale businesses how to utilize digital media social media to um to scale uh, businesses so if you're going to choose a career all of that to say that choose a career that one that is going to benefit you don't go to a job and say what can i get from this career but what can i become by being in this environment and I know this isn't my purpose. It's just a stepping stone. I don't feel like Allah created me to be working in a career for somebody. I feel like I was created to do khidmah, or to do work for my community. But in order to benefit my community, I have to learn. I have to, you know, to sustain myself. So when somebody calls me to give a khutbah or a teach, I can be like, I'm coming. I got you. I don't need a fee because I'm stable. Home is already taken care of, you know. But if I'm coming home, Mustaz Yusuf, I'm broke. Like, I'm going to run it up. The matches, y'all got to pay. And some of the matches, they don't have it. So I feel like I'm trading you know, one uh, Sheikh, Muhammad, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Sharif, I was teaching a class and I was charging people for the class, right? And uh, it was the, the hikam of Ibn Atal al-Skandari. So he sent me a message and he was like, oh, you're charging for that class. How much did your teachers charge you to learn that book? And it really hurt me, you know, because I was like, damn, my teachers didn't charge me anything. But because of the hustle, because I'm trying to provide for my family, I, I have to utilize what I have to gain money. And I don't think that's the right way. Um, Pause right there. Yeah. Pause, because that's the double-edged sword, and I want to tackle it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and while we're there, a uh, we always talk about the importance of because we're almost done. But I need to touch that. That is extremely important. 
Where are we at? One thirty nine. Uh, because I say that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people don't realize what I'm saying. And by you saying it, it's a perfect time to address several issues. Okay. Number one, the issue of our weekly commitment. Uh, Leslie, where are we at? Quickly. And our support of our efforts. Because what you just said is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely important. Okay, I'm spinning up. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, figure out where we're at real quick. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm terrible with this working these platforms. Uh, I don't know where we're at in terms of our... Uh, every week, we try to have raise for our efforts. In doing this work, a minimum of... 300 i mean 500 dollars okay so can we inshallah everyone now go to the various uh means of showing support for this platform the black imams round table so we can finish and reach our objective for the for the week inshallah uh is extremely important and i and i want to say that because of what you said okay. oftentimes I've been in this for a long time, yeah. right? Yeah. And I know with a lot of us, we want to just teach. Yeah. The reason that I'm able to do what I do is because I'm already supported through the work I do. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about, you know, how I'm going to get it done. I'm supported, right? But many of us don't have that fortune. Right, that 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 opportunity to just give. Yeah, yeah. So there is a responsibility on us as a community to facilitate for us to do that. So at one point, we say you shouldn't be teaching uh, at you know for money, but at the other point, we're not facilitating for you to teach for free, mm -hmm. which puts you in a or any teacher especially our teachers, because you are not um, funded. Yeah. You're not supported. Yeah. So you have to earn a living. If you go earn a living, then you can't teach because you're working for Mr. Charlie exactly. or you're doing what you yeah. got to do. Yeah, yeah. So we have to uh, balance that. And I don't know if it's the same. I'm assuming it's the same. When I was overseas in my study days, everybody else from all over the world in Egypt most of them were supported by organizations, by Masajid. Us, the few blacks it was in those days, we didn't have no funding. Mm -hmm. Is it similar today? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I, I, a bunch of students, I don't know people that, people, everybody knows in the hustle, many students that were brilliant, much more uh, intelligent than I, they had to go home just simply because they didn't have money. They didn't have, you know, people to support them. So, so all of these things I want to facilitate that inshallah we raise enough support that we can sustain our teachers yeah. and our students of knowledge and our message and that's yeah. why yeah. this whole economic piece that you talk is extremely important yeah uh because if we don't constantly do this it's going to be a self-defeating effort and we can't ignore that part and i just because you said it yeah so at the same time, tell him, don't charge for money. Okay, how is he going to eat? And if he yeah. got to go work and he got to do all that, then he's not going to have the time to teach. Yeah, no Because doubt. the nature of this system is to consume all of your time, which you talked about, having yeah. to work and someone telling you that consumes your time. It does, yeah. But their bottom line, their yeah. bottom line is what they're concerned about. But you may have a higher lofty objective, but if it's not facilitated, it's not going to be attainable. Yeah. So I just think, could you address that? I already did in my way, yeah. but in your your way as well. Yes. So essentially, that's the that's the, the, the you know the sort of conundrum that we're in as young students, and um, you know we're forced to like many people are teaching for money, and people are making good money off of it. But then I have people that say, "Yo, you shouldn't take money for for lessons." And I know brothers that are staunch that look at you like crazy if you're taking money. In fact, you're not a real student of knowledge if you're taking money for teaching. I have brothers in my circle that are on that type, on that wave. So, you know, for me, uh, I've never been a person that 
likes you know that likes fitna. So I just came home and I started working for myself. I already had the entrepreneur spirit as it is, but I left actually before I came here to Atlanta. I was in Tampa working at an Islamic school, and I, I was there for several months. And they built like they had like a thirteen million dollar institution I was working for. And when I got there, uh, I realized they were like, yeah, uh, uh, for the Islamic studies department, we pay great, we pay generously forty five thousand to teachers. And I was thinking like, subhanAllah, like I already have a, a bachelor's degree. I went to us, I got another degree working on a master's degree, but I'm going to come here and teach Islamic studies for $45,000 a year. How am I going to take care of my family like that? You know, how am I build myself up, build my community up with this? And it wasn't until, you know, I was, I had benefited the kids and was ready to leave that I realized they had a budget of, they could have easily paid six figures to someone to be the Islamic, the director of the Islamic studies department. But it's almost like if you are an Islamic studies teacher, you don't deserve to be paid. And I was shy to come to the table and be like, yo, I need this salary for, for teaching Islamic studies. I'm like, dang, I, no, my teachers didn't charge me to learn. Ashar is free. A scholar, the Sheikh Zuhair Khazan, dedicated seven hours a day we sat in his house and learned from this man. And he was broke. But he never charged us a penny, a dollar to learn from him. So I felt shy to come to the table and be like, y'all going to give me a salary to teach Islamic studies. But then one of the, another brother told me I work with now, he said that in life, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. You know, so I'm like, where do I find balance? Do I let my entrepreneurship go and make it a business of, of teaching? Or do I put teaching to the side, dedicate it when I have the time and focus on my career and focus on earning six figures and to taking care of my family. I can come and drop the bag off at the master and teach if I have the time to teach. Or well, you know, th those are just kind of things that I, I that the dilemma that I'm and really trying to figure out, you know, what to do. Um, I get brothers that guilt trip me for working. Like you're not living on purpose. Like you're wasting your time. And sometimes I do feel like that. Like I've been, I studied for all these years and now I'm not even giving back the, you know, to my community, at least to my, my you know. But you know, there's several elements to yeah. that that you need to consider yeah and, and i think we as a people this is a conversation that we do need to really think about because there is a balance let me ask you a question uh, you know I, you know i've put several students through school so i know what this stuff calls a decent living in egypt is what how much you say a month roughly so the top the top earners i'm talking about doctors and engineers make 2500 june that's what that's that's the top that's the salary in Egypt right now. Twenty five hundred June is about to say it's one hundred and sixty three dollars. People are surviving. Right. Off of that. So I know we say the average student, I try to allocate between three hundred to five hundred dollars a month. You balling out. No, that's how we do for the students. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we you try do, to do you know. that. Right. Mm -hmm. Which they live in nice, but they're single. They don't have families. They may have to go up if somebody got a family, right? But now here's the catch, right? Can you live off that in America, anybody? Absolutely not. Right. So what it takes for the sheikh in Egypt is not the same in America. Yeah. Let's not yeah. forget that. So you're telling me about what's going on. I mean, anyone or Egypt and Yemen and, and with all these places I study, it's not the same. Right, the burden on in America, in America, is extreme. Yeah, for anyone, yeah. especially if you're talking about a yeah. family. Yeah, it is. Like, to have a decent life anywhere in America, yeah, a decent life without extreme stress, you cannot get by with less than thirty five hundred to four thousand a month. Yeah, it's not gonna work. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a even if you do, it's a struggle. Yeah, yeah, it is. Right? That's a hard life. And we're talking about that. You're talking about that $45,000 a year. And at, at, at $45,000 a year, so we're saying that's forty eight. That's $4,000 a month, right? And consider this is America. They're going to tax that, too. Yeah, so you're not really bringing that home, actually. Right. Yeah. I mean, so we got to be realistic, right? You got to pay for gas. You got to pay for electric. You got to pay for rent. You got to pay for insurance. All these things that are necessary for your basic life in American society. You yeah. have to consider that. And now, if you don't consider that, which you mentioned earlier, 
is that your children going to be discouraged from ever pursuing such a career because yeah. it's a license to poverty. Yeah, yeah. So all of those things, when we have these discussions, you know, we're we're a little bit mature, more mature in our understanding of religion and our understanding of the Sharia. And, and it's a little bit more nuanced than just saying, yeah. you know, my teacher didn't get paid. Yeah, your teacher didn't live like you either. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So, I mean, you know what I mean? You got to be, and, 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 and you know the other thing, even though they struggling, those teachers, they're supported. Yeah, that's true. From somewhere yeah. else. You know, they're not just on their own line. Like you said, Al Azhar is free. Somebody's yeah. paying for that education. True, somebody is, yeah. You're just not paying. Somebody else is. Mm -hmm. The Sheikh has his zawiyah and the food and everything he's doing. Somebody's paying for that. Right? Yeah. yeah. They're making, you know, lucrative ways to support that. So these things, you got to be real. Right? And that's what one of my Sheikhs, he said, whoever judges over a people without knowing their conditions is a criminal. Mm, right mm, 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 mm. right that one who yaqum ala nas wa huwa la ya'lamu ahwalihim ahwalahum from yeah. mujrim yeah it's true right that person doesn't know their stuff he's a criminal so you telling me how you're putting yemen or egypt or syria in america it doesn't work yeah it doesn't it's not real and I think this, I just say that as a balance to that. Yeah. Because we're dealing with real life circumstances. That's true. That's true. Then add on that, in our communities, our children are watching abundance of wealth. Yeah. Right? The TV, media, through the music, when they walk down the street, right? So you got to be realistic. I'm, you know what I'm saying? If you're, especially in Dawa. You got to understand the circumstances you live in. Yeah, and Islam is never going to look the same in every different place. Islam in West Africa doesn't look like Islam in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Right? And I just think that part of navigating our development, Islamic knowledge is very important. Mm. You know, I, I just, you know, that that's my thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and I pray that, inshallah, we get to a point where that um that the business people in our communities are invested and there's there's a great spiritual refinement in giving because we uh, as a people have the highest amount of spending power so it's not that we don't have the money even in our power poverty in our situations we spend money like nobody's business but people spend money on what they value so some of the most talented students come home and as they say we get they get on the circuit myself included because people on the circuit are willing to pay they're not going to question you. Uh, you know, uh, I had a brother tell me the other day, you know, he's like, I want you to do a Juma every Friday in this month, but I'm not going to pay you because I want to make sure I'm going to help you to make sure that your knee is correct. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he texted me, brother, I haven't heard back from you and you will never hear back from me like talking. <laughs> Hey, like, what is this nonsense? Like, you know, like that was that was smooth. That, that was, was a good one. That was a good one. He, he ain't know I'm he had a Philly cat. Get the sewer for you. <laughs> yeah, he ain't know he was dealing with a Southwest Philly cat. So that's the kind of stuff that we be dealing with, man. And I'm like, you know, Subhanallah. It, 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 he'd have got me before, but I've been around a little while now, and I figure out like, nah, we're not, we're not, we're not playing those games, man. Go help you break your nuts. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna help you break your nuts. <laughs> You said you need some tarbiya. Right, you ain't see these guys' prices out. Like, stop playing games. <laughs> so, you know, that's what we're dealing with, man. Um, you know, may Allah, may Allah make it easy. Uh, but I pray that that financial empowerment is the way. Uh, you know, I, I was I was like reading Surah Al Baqarah, and it talks about like that uh, the Quran is a is a guidance for the mutakin. And then it goes on to give you a description who the mutaqeen are. Those who believe in the unseen. Uh, those who establish their prayers. Like, and it, it, it was as if I read that ayah for the first time because here Allah Ta'ala is talking about believing in the unseen. Whole aqidah, right? Establishing your prayers. Again, fiqh. 
And then uh, when Allah gives you money that you spend the money that you were given, that's ihsan, that's tazkiyah, that's tasawwuf, right? And, and, and I asked uh, one of my teachers about that. I, he said, the reason why Allah Ta'ala, you know, makes us, gives us the training of giving is because there's going to come a day where we have to give our souls to the angel of death. And if you can't give a dollar, you can't give $20, fisa how are you going to give your soul when it comes time the angel says give it? So many of us, that stinginess that we have, that we don't want to give for Allah, but we can spend $500 on some, some bread bottom shoes or $1,000 on things that are depreciating assets. Like, there's a deep connection between our spending powers and our deen. You know, and, and that's, that's seen in the Quran. That they, they give back. Uh, that you will never know what goodness is until you spend it from that which you love. So we got to spend from that which Allah loves. You know, so it's not like we don't have the money in the community. We have it, but we're just not willing to invest in our own to give back to our masajid. But we will drop $500, $1,500 on, on that bag on depreciating assets. But a masjid is an appreciating asset. And, you know, we talk about residual income. Let's talk about residual barakah. You know, so, yeah, that I'm, 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 I'm on that wave. And I pray that Allah allows me to be wealthy just so I can give it all away. That's my sole purpose, man. I want, I want, I want to see my imams balling out. I want to see our matches balled out. I want to see Islam, uh, you know, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'at spread. Our teachers teaching all across the country. I want to see Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'at not shy about this thing, man. I want to see us on full blast, you know, teaching people and 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 not shy about la ilaha illallah, not shy about making dhikr, uh, you know, out in public and open, and not shy about these things. But to get that message out that you've been talking about and that which reformed you in America, that's going to take money. Support. Yeah, you need the money. Take support. Yeah. I mean, and it's not enough of us, two things. It's not enough of us who understand its importance. Yeah. That's number one. It's not enough. So we got to do the platforms we have just to get the awareness of the importance of a da'wah and yeah. teaching and educating and both religiously and worldly mm -hmm. the importance of that and then we got to actually follow through with it yeah right so i mean i think that's just conversations that we we can't shy away from because there is a balance between a dean and a dunya that yeah. we have to strike yeah. right yeah if we're ever going to be successful in our da'wah in the United States of America. No doubt, no doubt. You know you have to have some wasatiyah here. Right? Yeah. It's a must. Yeah. And we're not saying extremes, but, you know, I, I, I just, I, I'll give you an example. Just a shameless plug. Can I have a shameless plug? Yeah, bismillah. This is the imams. They got to give me permission. Permission granted. I go in the masjid yesterday, right? And we're up, I have contractors come, we're up on the roof fixing the roof because we got this big 10,000 square foot building with a roof that has not been refixed in almost 70 years. Yeah, man, speak about so it. So that's, you can imagine, you've been to our master, you gave Juma there. So you mm. know how big that master is. Huge. That whole roof is a block long, needs to be, taken off not repaired like we've been doing it got to come off because the wood and all that is mm -hmm. deteriorating it's been like that for far too long yeah and the the amount that we need to do it is very high and and the job can't be done by anyone so you can't say oh let's get away with fifty thousand. yeah you're gonna get a fifty thousand dollar headache yeah. right so we got to keep raising right so we're on the roof, we still got to fix and we're doing what we got to do. So I'm on the roof with the contractor and we're walking by and he says, I smell gas. Wow. I'm like, yeah, I do too, but I can't find it. And it's not the first time we smelt this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Looking, we looking, we looking, we looking, we looking, we look, we don't find nothing. So when we finish the roof job, I come down and I run to the gas company and I call the gas company and I said, we got a leak. I don't know where it is, but we have a leak. So they all over the whole building can't find nothing. We get on the roof. I said, this is the area where I smell gas. They looking, looking. Don't they got their equipment. 
and then they stick the you know the thing that they detect gas right yeah. mm -hmm. into the roof itself mm -hmm. to discover there's a leak in a pipe inside the roof between the roof and the building so it doesn't come in the building it's above the roof but it's protected to protect the pipes and the gas is being held in the pipe and only seeping out when the wind blows wow smell it. Mm. so at that point we discovered you got to do all the pipes on the outside because in those days the pipes they used were not the same as the galvanized steel that you need to so all that stuff got to be replaced wow okay fine because and he's shown it, it's deteriorating you got to fix this mm. now what right if we don't think about money who's going to do that the government's not going to come do that for you right that's like it's not that like Egypt, the masjid is wakaf, and the yeah. government will just fix it. Like that, this is America. Best you got is your 501c3, and you better raise some money. That's it. So I'm just giving you, and this was just now a whole new problem that we knew nothing about. Right? And the bills that was related to it, because we didn't know. You see my point? Yeah, yeah. That's a real life situation in every single masjid. Imam Naeem, Imam Fahim, they could tell you about running masjids and stuff just all of a sudden. We tried to stretch it as long as we can. Now it's an emergency. Yeah. Right? This happens all the time. So these things are extremely important when we say support our institutions, support our stuff, because this is a regular life, yeah. right, of our communities. And we don't have a bunch of, and that's where the education comes in. That's where careers, entrepreneurs, because we don't have a bunch of doctors that say, you know what, that whole project is going to cost 20 grand, no problem. Just give me a write-off and go ahead, don't worry about it. We don't have that, right? Because it's people that's like that, you know. And you know, from being on the show, as you say, on the circuit, mm -hmm. I see what happens. Mm -hmm. I see where the doctor just... You know, I want my son to be a hafiz here. Here's 30, 40,000. Go do it. Mm -hmm. I seen they have a project. Somebody comes in, writes a check. So we got to develop in the future in our community for all of these things that exist in real life experiences. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I think the beauty of it, Imam, I, I, the, the reason we even got to this conversation, I called Imam Amin earlier about this thing, you know, about offering my help, you know, for some information that I have about raising funds for nonprofits or whatever. And then he invited me here. So a lot of times the best of planners. So I extend the same invitation to our imams or anybody that has nonprofits, you know, that uh, that is doing actual work, massage institutions, inshallah ta'ala, I'm willing to, my service, my contribution in any way is to, you know, create structures. The same things I've been learning, how to scale businesses, how to scale a message, how to scale 501c3s, how to scale institutions. So uh, I offer that Ramadan, as we know, is the perfect time to do that when people have the softness of the hearts and they're more uh, willing to, to give. So inshallah, imams, I'll, uh, I'll get your numbers, inshallah, I'll be reaching out to you uh, with the same conversation I had with Imam Amin earlier today. Inshallah, we're going to bring it to a close. Can you have some final statements between the imams and then we'll let you close us out, inshallah. Okay, bismillah. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything, man. Uh, it's a great show, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I'm with Imam Fahim. I'm just, I'm just waiting. I wish the conversation going on longer, you know, about to make me some more popcorn. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's not only just, it's not only just like feel, you know, good, feel good information. He's, you know, you, you've really been, you know, dropping it on us and giving us real, comprehensive information and you know alhamdulillah may allah in increase you in all that is good and bless and protect you and your family and all of your loved ones and also uh, all of you who joined us tonight may allah reward you all and bless you for participating in the conversation putting your ideas and asking your questions and supporting the work we do and may allah bless you all as well Before we go, uh, Imam Naeem, uh, what about the Gambia trip? 
I want so we can put that out, give people as much time, information as possible. Samira, where are you posting? Let's go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's there. Alhamdulillah. Uh, on June 18th, we're uh, hosting a two week uh, tour to Gambia. Uh, the theme is tracing our Islamic roots. So, you know, we're going to we're going to be there. We're going to. Uh, Gonna visit some Quran schools. We're gonna visit Jufare, you know where Kuti Kente was from, and we're going. We we're gonna we have a a a, a good trip uh, for you all. Alhamdulillah. Actually, we're at the deadline for the deposit, which is five uh, hundred dollars. The total cost of the of the trip is a uh, dollar short of three thousand dollars. But if you want to hold your spot and you're interested in going, you know. Uh, we request a, a five hundred dollar deposit, and you know, alhamdulillah, we're gonna, gonna, we're gonna make, we're gonna make it do what it do, alhamdulillah. A lot of you know, I, you know, I have family in Gambia. I go there regularly, but you know, inshallah, I'm sharing a little bit of what I've known and experienced with you all. So it's gonna be uh, a beautiful trip, alhamdulillah. Okay, so it ain't, it ain't too late. Today's the last day. Uh, you know, but you know, I'm quite sure if you got your whole thing or a little bit above deposit, negotiations are available. <laughs> yes, we, you know, we, 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 we're flexible, <laughs> especially you ain't heard about it till now. You know, you know we got you. <laughs> we might extend it to 12 a.m. West Coast time, Pacific time, <laughs> but support all of our efforts, inshallah. Uh, uh, Yusuf, do you have where they can reach your, find out what your work, what, you know, where's your link, where's your, this is the opportunity, everybody got to put their stuff out there. But see, that's the good thing about us running our own you, stuff. You, you, you on, you on mute. Okay. Ooh, yeah. Uh, I don't even know where, where, where do I comment at? You see right there in the comment box. Okay. Oh, maybe because I'm full screen, I can't see it. Nah, he might have to go to another device or open up. Uh, oh, what you on a computer or you on a phone? Yeah, on a computer. Then it should be right there, or just give us your information. Where yeah, is, is this my name on all social media platforms? Uh, Facebook, Instagram, the same thing. My website and my email is yusufkroma at gmail dot com. Okay. Um, oh, man, wrong guy to ask all that. I can't type. <laughs> like, you you don't see a box right there to type. No, I see on the private chat. I see it, but yeah, he can do it in the private. Go up to comments. Chat. Go up to comments. Yeah, when no, I you, comments. you can't comment from Streamyard. He has to, it has to be from Facebook. Yeah, only you, the host, can comment from Streamyard. Yeah, wow. he could be from YouTube or Facebook, but he can't comment from um. Streamyard. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, well, okay. And look, and support all of our efforts, especially this roof. And Master Muhammad, because I don't want to hear no more about this roof, man. Hey, this hey, is hey, 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 I talk hey. about today. Listen, hey, <laughs> hey, let me explain something to you. The roof, the roof. Shy guys go hungry. And listen, we got to keep this thing going. So we better speak up. Right? <laughs> you, you know, you know, you get this, uh, you get this uh, idea. I used to have this Superman imam attitude. Don't worry, I'll do it myself. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had two babies. Two new babies. I was like, I can't keep doing that. <laughs> I got it. Don't worry, I'm a ball. I'm, I've been getting money since I was a puppy. Yeah, all right. Right. <laughs> Look, there you go like this. <laughs> Time. Nah, 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 nah. I, I went back to my little door. When my daughter was a baby, the door explorer thing. Clean work makes the dream work. <laughs> yeah. Swipe it, no swiping. Yeah, swipe it, no swiping. <laughs> All this go for it yourself stuff. No, 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 no. So Muti, you heard the poor. Get it, get, 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 get your bank account ready. Come on. Meet me at the master with a check. Yeah, that's been that, that residual butter cause we were trying to get. Tell you, okay, say you D. Any last comments in Dua? Uh, no, alhamdulillah, I just wanted to thank y'all, man. Uh, you know, sometimes they say, I, I was reaching, watching a documentary uh, on Netflix. It says that when a giant looks into the mirror, he just sees himself. He, just, he doesn't see it. So you guys are the giants, and, and that and we stand on your shoulders, and I really mean that. 
So sometimes you may see the work that you're doing, things like the roundhouse table. You never know who you're watching, never know who you're influencing. I can't tell me how many hours I spent on YouTube listening to the conversations, watching you guys engage each other, and just the brotherhood and the suhba and what it has done for me and others like me. I saw CD Nail in the comments, young up and coming brothers. It means a lot for us to see you guys to, you know, together as men, building as friends, the companionship, <laughs> anything else. This is beautiful to see the unity between you all. So it really means a lot to me. I'm honored that you guys, you know, consider me worthy of being on the show, the way you guys big up me. I uh, just ask for your prayer, ask for your do I really beg for your mentorship, you know, to not let young brothers come home and we just be out doing our own thing. And I'll never be the one where you, you know, I'm too big, you can't pull my ear or uncheckable. You know, that kind of guidance, that kind of tough love is what we as young men need. So, you know, I hold you guys accountable for that to take young men. If you see potential in us, if you see us doing our thing, we have light to not let that light go out without your mentorship and not let, you know, you guys pass by without giving us the banner. I, I think a lot of times in our community, you know, we don't get, receive the banner until we have to pull it from the graveyard at the Janaza. You know, why you guys are alive, why you guys are living, have the energy. Let us sit with y'all. Let us learn with y'all. Let us learn from y'all. So, you know, when you guys are no longer here, we know what to do. And we don't have to learn on the job. You know, that that, that learning curve is very steep. So if you guys can take us, and it's our job to reach out and communicate with y'all, but just, you know, to not forget us and realize that we are in need of, more in need of you than you are in, in need of us. So as the Prophet Sallallahu says that he who does not have mercy on the young, and does not have respect for the elders, then he's not from amongst us. So we respect y'all. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. We have gratitude for y'all. And we just ask for y'all mercy and the patience with our young tendencies and habits. So may Allah bless y'all. May Allah love you, increase you, and keep y'all strong, and give you guys long lives, and give you guys the support uh, that you guys need. And if not from the people, then may Allah Ta'ala send his friends from the Mala'ika, like he sent to Ahl al-Badr. You know, if, we, if the people don't do it, Allah has his friends and has his creations that will come and get it done. That will take that roof off and replace it if the Muslims ain't ready. So uh, I pray that Allah Ta'ala makes us people that are ready for the opportunity to make us people that have a softness in our hearts uh, and softness in our interaction with each other, have patience with one another, overlook each other, build each other up, love us, love ourselves, love our own. As they, you know, as one of the elders says, do for self, love your own, you know. So may we inherit that, uh, that, that, that tradition and that wisdom. Uh, and I ask your forgiveness if I talk too much. Uh, you know, and for my shortcomings. Uh, so please forgive me and make the art for me, inshallah, my family, and make the art for my parents. It really extended a lot uh, so I can be here today doing what I'm doing and sacrifice, to sacrifice their bodies, you know, uh, physical bodies, so that I can be here doing uh, what I'm doing today. So a lot of what you see today is from their sacrifice, from their heart, sweat, blood, and tears that they put into us and my, my siblings. So please, if you see anything that's good in me, it's from my parents. Uh, please make the offer them. You're closing us out with dua, insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman al-Fatiha. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm i-deen. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-ladhina namta alayhim. Ghayr al-maggubi alayhim. Al-adhalin. Amin. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تحل بها الأقد وتفرج بها القرب وتقضى بها الهوائج اللهم أجل رفك في أمر كل سبحانك ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على مرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بارك الله فيكم